Thompson playing first base. He hits cleanup. Jason Thompson has a sore knee and probably will see little action the rest of the year as they take a look at Bream. Mike Brown, one of those they got from the Angels in the John Candelaria George Hendrick transaction, is the right fielder, strong right handed hitter. Denny Gonzalez takes over from Madlock at third base. Not a very good fielder, occasional power. Sammy Khalifa, the young shortstop they think very highly of, will hit seventh. Junior Ortiz, former Met, will catch in place of Pena. Rick Roden is the pitcher, and the roar you hear in the background, Dr. K striding to the mound in front of a crowd of some 40,000 at Chase Stadium. Dr. K, in many instances, doesn't need a whole lot of defense behind him, but they'll throw it out there anyway today. Danny Heap in left field for George Foster. Mookie Wilson back and adding some ex extra base power in center field. Daryl Strawberry in right. Howard Johnson, the switch hitter in third. Rafael Santana, who has gone a little bit unnoticed on this ball club, played very steady baseball. Wally Backman at second base. He's been hitting just left-handed the last few ball games against left-handed pitchers. Keith Hernandez, the standard at first base. And I think, Bob, that the people in this town and all over baseball are finding out the greatness of Gary Carter playing a day game after night game with terrible, terrible knee problem. And boy, he's got to be hurting after last night. Dwight Gooden on the mound. And we'll see those K's posted whenever he gets from the upper left field, upper deck. 31 consecutive scoreless innings to drop the ERA to 1.62. Had a 14-game winning streak, halted a couple of weeks ago when he lost to the Giants at San Francisco. 276 strikeouts, that's the best in the majors. Last year, in his rookie season, he was 3-0 against the Pirates, including a 16-strikeout game against them. This is his first appearance against Pittsburgh in 1985. A 20-year-old who has the marvelous facility to deflect tough questions from the press. He's been protected by the PR people here certain times because he is so young. But all he wanted to talk about yesterday and the day before is not so much his pitching in the pennant race, but the fact that Tom Seaver, who has 18 base hits career, that's the Mets club record for a pitcher. And Gooden says, I'm one short, and I got a chance to get it and surpass it tomorrow against Roden. So... He's just got such tremendous composure along with great physical talent. He has already joined Seaver, who did it four times, and Jerry Kuzman, who did it once, as the only 20-game winners in Met history. Two good hitting pitchers working today. Gooden for the Mets and Rick Roden, who has long been one of the game's most dangerous pitchers with a bat in his hands, going for the Pirates. Joe Orsalak has the highest batting average of any National League rookie. It was his defense that was of importance last night, however. A drive by Clint Hurdle almost to the 410 sign in dead center field that could have won it in the bottom of the knife, and Orsalak hauled it down. Hold on, it's going to get noisy, folks. Fastball is high. Unlike a lot of pitchers who throw their hardest early, Gooden will generally start in the 89 to 90 mile an hour range first couple of innings. Then in the middle of the game, he'll hit a stride at 93, 94, but still have something in reserve for the tight situations and fire that 96 or 97. Well, Mel Stoudemire says that most of the ball game, he is not an awesome fastball pitcher. But when he gets two strikes, he can get up to 95. Late in the ball game, as you said, he can get up 95. He's always got the little bit extra. The last outing he had, he threw just 110 pitches, did not throw a change up, Orsalak lifts this one into shallow center. Backman comes back, and in comes what? Wilson to drop it. Mookie Wilson dropped it, and he'll be charged with an error. The Mets made two errors last night. Only the Cardinals have committed fewer errors in the National League, so this is atypical, but Wilson starts the game with a miscue for New York. It's a hazy day. I do not believe the Sun had anything to do with it. He just peaked when he saw the shortstop Santana and Backman in the area. This is what... Chuck Tanner wants to do with this new young team he's got against Gooden especially get somebody on early although Gooden has speeded up his move to first base in the home you can still steal on him and Orsalak has that capability he leads the Pirates with 18 steals he's been caught eight times switch hitter R.J. Reynolds fastball hit hard and Backman won't get to it around second is Orsalak but he'll hold there Strawberry has a good arm so an error and a single put two on with nobody out Oh, Pops, Willie Stargell down at first base. Moved over there, Steve Demeter was there earlier in the year. One of the amazing things also about, and I keep using Casey Stengel's adjective when he talked about the amazing Mets, but I mean this not as facetiously as Casey did, but that Gooden doesn't walk many. 
He's had three ball games already this year where he hasn't walked anybody four more. He walked just one. He's walked four just one time in all of his starts so far this season. He can spot the fastball and do a little different tricky things with it. Johnny Ray, like Reynolds, a switch hitter, squares to bunt and gets it down. It's a good bunt. Dwight's play is to first successful sacrifice. Doris Gooden at Hillsborough High School down in the Tampa area. And Floyd Yeomans now with Montreal was the pitcher. Gooden played third base, so he's an also a good fielder along with being a good hitter. That'll bring up Sid Bream, who hit 370 at Albuquerque. The Dodgers triple-A farm where on occasion batting statistics are inflated the Pacific Coast League definitely a hitters league. He's done well since getting an opportunity in Pittsburgh a few days ago in Montreal. He had a single double and home run. So we will try now we will see now Dwight couldn't try and accelerate a little bit and not save anything for the last part of the ball game. He's got to be thinking strikeout right now. In St. Louis it's Gullickson for the Expos and Tudor for the cards. A two game lead on the Mets with 15 to play. Fastball misses. Three of those 15 are at St. Louis, October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. The edge would belong to the Cardinals. The Mets don't play well on artificial surface, and Bush Stadium is not a good park for home run hitters, and that's a big part of the Mets' attack. Fastball swung on and missed. As a hitter, you go up there the same as Koufax or any guy who's got the two awesome pitch. You say, I want to lay off the fastball above the belt. You can't. you got to pull the trigger so soon. And I want to lay off the breaking ball in the dirt. You can't because it breaks so sharply. So you can talk to yourself while you want in the batter's box, but guys like Gooden, it's impossible to do it against. Another fastball high and away. Mike Marshall of the Dodgers put it this way. He said, Gooden is the only guy who can say to you here comes the fastball and I'm going to put it right there. You know it and you can't hit it anyway. Mel Stoudemire last season and this is where the aptitude of this young man comes in said I started working at him just a brief time at the end of the season with a cut fastball running on the fist of the left hander and he said he's got it down pat anytime he wants to now. There's the well. curve but it just misses three and one. John McSherry the home plate umpire good and doesn't say much to umpires but it looked like you wanted that pitch. He thought he backdoored it. McSherry, an outstanding base on balls guy. Good umpire. Second and third, one out, and here's the 3-1 pitch. They're loaded now. An error by Wilson on Orsalak's bloop to center. A single by Reynolds. A sacrifice bunt by Johnny Ray, and then a walk to Bream. Loads them up for Mike Brown. Another thing that Mal Stoudemire began in spring training working with Dwight Gooden is to go from a four seam fastball one that rides or that he can cut it to the left hander a two seamer that will run into a right hander and a time sink. Will this be the time you look for a double playoff Brown who hits the ball hard. Starts him with a fastball for a strike. St. Louis Tim Raines led off against Tudor with a single stole second and right now with one out he's at second base and Andre Dawson is the expo hitter in the top of the first there we'll keep you posted. Heat again and a chopper that'll get a run home Gooden covers and Hernandez shovels it to it. Gooden has only thrown a couple of curveballs so far. So it would have been difficult for Mike Brown to do, but he comes from the Gene Mock School of baseball, and I just wonder, and he did. You can see by his swing that even against a power pitcher like Gooden, he was trying to hit the ball to the right side of the diamond. He got a fastball over the plate, hit it to the left side a little bit easier to turn to 5-4-3 or 6-4-3 double play. He went the opposite way against Gooden's fastball. As the Pirates take a one nothing lead here Andre Dawson popped up in St. Louis it brings up Hubie Brooks in that ball game with Reigns still at second and now two out on the top of the first strike one is called in the heat of the pennant race Gooden has twice been given an extra day's rest by Davy Johnson. Davy not panicking and using him on three days rest instead has twice given him five when he felt that he might have needed 
a little bit extra time off. The breaking ball is outside and low, 2 and 0. Davy Johnson's bullpen, I feel, needs a little bit of rest. McDowell has been in three consecutive ball games for him now. I believe the count is one and one, and the scoreboard is wrong, but we'll check. make the mitt pop like that. I'm sure you can hear it at home as it slams into Gary Carter's glove. People have, people have been at field level for both Gooden and Sandy Koufax. Say Koufax threw harder. For Sandy didn't do that for me. I mean he had to cut down his speed because he was so wild his first five or six years in the major leagues. Gooden's never had to do that. He has such remarkable control. The count is two and one. Scoreboard was incorrect a moment ago. is the runner at third base. Full count. We're going to get this count right eventually. It's two and two. Carter right in this situation with that great good and downer as the fans get into the ball game now. He knows very well if good snaps off a good one, he's going to have to block it with that runner on third base. Let's see if he goes curve or fastball. goes up out at left field. Meanwhile, Hubie Brooks singled Tim Raines home. So the Expos have a one nothing lead on the card. The scoreless inning streak snapped at 31. Rick Roden takes a one nothing lead to the mound on the bottom of the first and faces this lineup. Mookie Wilson in center field. Wally Backman is the second baseman. Keith Hernandez at first base. Gary Carter the cleanup man. Darryl Strawberry will bat fifth. Keep the left-handed batter for Foster in left field. Howard Johnson at third base. Santana at shortstop. And Gooden, of course, the pitcher. Gonzalez was in on the grass expecting a possible bunt from Wilson, who takes high for a ball. Mookie has been hot. Four three-hit games in his last nine starts. 2-0. and oh. Bob, you talked in our opening about the Pittsburgh Pirates no longer being pushovers. They've averaged about four and a half runs scored per game over the last 20 ball games. Their pitching staff's ERA has been about two and a half. They've struggled in both departments, been down at the bottom the league standings in those areas most of this year. Roden with a little sinker running fastball. He does not throw a slider. He throws a cut fastball, running the fist of the left-handers. He gets accused all the time of doctoring the baseball and a slur. Surprisingly good fielder. Holds runners on base well, Rick Roden. As a kid, he had osteomyelitis, same disease that Mickey Mantle had. Davey Johnson, who's trying to pick a couple, couple of games up before he goes on the road. And a leadoff walk to Mookie Wilson. It brings Wally Backman to the plate as we take a look at the Pirate defense. A defense that about a week or so ago made seven errors in one ball game. They can be inconsistent, but they haven't played together long, and they're young. R.J. Reynolds, Joe Arslick Brown, they can go get in the outfield. Gonzalez, Khalifa, Johnny Ray, and Sid Bream with Junior Ortiz catching Roden tonight, this afternoon. You mentioned the fact that as a youngster, Roden had osteomyelitis. Mickey Mantle had it, as you said. Al Kaline, too. And it withered Roden's right leg, which he has since built up. Opposite field by Backman, and it's a fair ball on extra bases. Wilson is going to score. Just like that, the game is tied. Backman will be stopped at second. like so many other pesky wood tech type players will take what you give him. He had Gonzalez up tight at third when they just slap it by him on the ground. He ends up with a double. He was going to left field all the way trying to push it by the third baseman. And 
And now Hernandez, whose seventh inning single tied the game at five apiece as the Mets rallied for three after trailing 5-2. That was last night. They eventually lost it in 11-7-5 on a bad hop hit by R.J. Reynolds. And Hernandez speculates that the work the grounds crew did before the St. Louis series here about a week ago may have had something to do with it. They watered the infield down to slow the Cardinal speedsters, and he says it's been bumpy and inconsistent since then. 2-0. and oh. Ortiz will have a conference with Rick Roden. Well, perhaps Davey Johnson made the statement this morning that they're going to have to win it on the road now. And the three games of the Cardinals will be very important, but perhaps it'll do this ball club good to get out of New York a little while off the media hype and everything else. Get on the road, they can relax a little bit more. After tomorrow, when they play the Pirates again, Davey Johnson's team has 13 games remaining, 10 of them on the road. 3 0. Oh. In contrast, after the Cardinals play the Expos tomorrow at Bush Stadium, 10 of their remaining 13 are in St. Louis, so the edge belongs to the Cards. Mets have played nine games above 500 on the road. 40 and 31. Grant Jackson, the pitching coach, along with Chuck Tanner. Ball strike. Hernandez was looking inside. He had the green light. Roden ran the fastball away. Hernandez, nobody out, three and one. Runner on second, wants to get the ball on the right side. Well, the reason Whitey Herzog used to get upset with Hernandez at times was hitting in the three slot for Herzog. He didn't want to pull the ball as much as Whitey thought he should. As Hernandez trots down to first, two on for Gary Carter. And out comes Grant Jackson to talk with Rick Roden. Roden really has pitched very well over his career against the Mets. 25 lifetime starts. Roden with a 2.18 ERA. Roden is just 9 and 13 this year, but 3 and 0 over his last seven starts. Obviously, four de no decisions mixed in, and his ERA is under two in those last seven appearances. A pitching staff that last season under Chuck Tanner. Led the major leagues in ERA, and yet they finished last. He's already reached that first inning, haven't you? You may see a little emblem on the side of Tanner's cap the next time we get a shot of it. The word attitude attached to his pirate cap, and he has had to call upon all of his eternal optimism this year, both with the way his club has performed on the field and all the outside distractions, the drug situation, the possibility of the franchise being sold subpoenaed or leaving last, town. Subpoenaed last week to testify. Remember when Stars in their championship year had the attitude stars that they put all over caps for achievement? He and Madlock, some of the others. Elmont, no, not Steve Demeter. Now to Tanner's left. Carter with 29 homers. His career high with the Expos was 31 takes a ball you know you could make a case for him as an MVP candidate both with what he's done at the plate and the way he's handled this young pitching staff as Mike Lupica of the New York Daily News put it he's handled a baby staff like an expert pediatrician 2 and 0 one so much his handling of good or even darling was here all last year although darling struggled the second half but Aguilera Sid Fernandez Made Lynch a darn good starting pitcher, too. Will the bullpen be good enough, though, to get him through the rough road? Because the bullpen becomes more important on the road. Well, Orozco has struggled. Sisk is disabled. Hit hard. Could be two. Oh. Khalifa can't handle it. The bases are loaded. Cannot tell for sure if Wally Bachman may have blocked the view. We'll see it on this. The ball's crushed. It's a sinker. You betcha. A ball that bounced up. It was hit so hard that Khalifa could not play a hop. Remember, this team plays most of their games on artificial surface. Where you can play a little bit more deeply. He gets caught in between. And by Bachman jumping over, it may have blocked his view just a little bit. A tough air to give. You've got to give it. 
They do not give him an error. They that's, scored a hit. That's ridiculous, that's but they you scored a hit. It's charitable. It was not an easy play for 21-year-old Sammy Khalifa. He was blocked out, which may have been a consideration of the official score, but he's got to come up with that. He'd have Roden out of trouble right now. And how will Roden feel about it if subsequent runs are earned? Pirates got an unearned run off Gooden in the top half of the first. 1-1 one, one with Strawberry at the plate. That was Buddy Harrelson, the third base coach. Hernandez down at second base. There's Carter along with hitting instructor Bill Robinson. This guy right here could make a big difference. He's been hot since he got back in the lineup with the thumb, but some of the players think he could still carry them over a week's period of time. Carter's got to be getting run down. Bases loaded, nobody out, a run already home. Too slippery one that Junior Ortiz could not handle. If a pitcher is going to throw a doctored pitch, if not accused Roden of anything, he will let the catcher know somehow so the catcher can react to any very erratic break on the ball. They say he doesn't throw a slider. That baby went down and in to Strawberry in a big hurry, and Ortiz couldn't get at it. I would assume it's going to be a wild pitch. This is a stoppable ball for Ortiz, and you would think that Pena, with that great glove, might have gotten a piece of it and knocked it down. He's one of the standards in baseball among catchers, Pena, but he's not there today. It is scored a wild pitch. 2-1 Met lead, and the count now at 2-2. Two two. In the bottom of the first at St. Louis, with the Expos leading the Cardinals 1-0, Willie McGee is aboard with an infield single. And with two out, he's at first base, and Jack Clark is the Cardinal hitter. Off-speed pitch in the dirt, and now the count is full. Danny Heap on deck. Well, first base is open. Danny Heap also left-handed, so the percentages wouldn't be in your favor, but there's no way to think that he will throw him a hittable pitch in this, unless it's a bad mistake. Put it on. Heap doesn't run like Strawberry. You got the chance for a double play. Heap and then Johnson up next. Wouldn't be surprised if we're right back to a breaking ball. Or a fastball off the plate inside that he might try and jam with, but I don't know if it's going to be a strike. Looks like a fastball call inside. We'll see. It's a breaking ball, and he lofts it into shallow left. Hernandez will not tag. The catch is made by Reynolds, and the runners hold. Let's go to Len Berman at our studios here in New York for an update. Len? Thank you, Bob. Top of the first inning in St. Louis. Here's that Montreal run you talked about. Hubie Brooks base hit. Look at Van Slyke's throw. Daryl Porter cannot put the tag on Tim Raines. It's now 1 0 Montreal. They've completed the first inning in St. Louis. Back to Shea. Okay, Len. So both Tudor and Gooden are nicked for runs in their first inning of work today. The runoff Gooden unearned here. Strike one to heap. Infield now has come about halfway. Chuck Tanner, the peripatetic manager of the Pirates, up out of the dugout, top step, setting his defense, moving him around. Did he hold? They check, and he did. Third base up is Billy Williams. He's the crew chief. Charlie Williams, the up at first, and Randy Marsh at second. And as we told you, big John McSherry back of the plate. One pitch. Lollipop misses. Well, showed you earlier one of Roden's strong suits has always been his control. Not so far today. It's through there. Green couldn't come up with it. Hernandez scores. Carter is stopped. Runners at the corners with one out and a 3 1 lead.
you can't always tell and I haven't seen Green play first base that much but his reactions were not terribly quick on this one. Well it's a nice warm day in shade and with the ground level seats people with a lot of white shirts perhaps he didn't pick up the ball off the bat as well as he might in the night baseball didn't react well. The other hand which you said may be true he just may not be a very good defensive first base but we haven't seen that much of him. At other times in their history the Mets have had a Ronald McDonald in their organization also a ball player named Gene Autry and now they welcome Howard Johnson. Tanner playing his infield in as he did leaving more openings an obvious tribute to Dwight Gooden who's in so many low run ball games and Tanner figures can't afford to give him any more we pull the infield in and you take your chance with a big inning hope he hits it right at somebody and he did. Davey Johnson has molded a marvelous marvelous chemistry I think on this Mets ball club the bench has contributed Mookie Wilson was down Dykstra contributed heat and a big part when Davey Johnson put him in ball game now they got Boa he got a base set in Montreal to win a ball game in the first game second game a double header. He likens the bench he has now especially with the late season addition of Tom Pachorek and then Boa likens it to the bench Danny Ozark had in the late 70s with the Phillies and Davey Johnson was part of that group of Philadelphia reserves. 2 0 pitch to Johnson 2 and 1. Not a base dealer, but Howard Johnson can't get his bat on the ball. Let's see if Davey Johnson doesn't start a runner. Try and stay out of a double play. Not, not going. Fouled off. Leave that hole open for Johnson to pull the ball through. Roden knows that he runs a fastball away, trying to make him hit the middle of the diamond. Another possibility of a running game going here. at third heap at first still only one out bottom of the first three one New York off speed pitch grounded foul Davy Johnson on his wall lineup card you heard may have heard of talk about it, us talk about it before he puts all the times of the from the initial move that a pitcher makes to home plate to try and get a beat on how quick he is to just as a refresher for him and he lists Roden as one of the quickest in the game at getting the ball to home plate in his first move also to first base so that may tell him not to run runner off first base again he stays put and now the count is full which might change Davy Johnson's thinking a little Tudor set the Expos down in order in the top of the second at Bush Stadium so after one and a half now Expos with Gullickson lead Tudor in the cards one zip now I'd be very surprised if he wasn't going down he was on two and one and two and two still not young Davy Johnson has a reason for it I don't know why he's got those computer sheets Maybe sees a big inning going here. Santana's bat has been a little bit better the last couple of months. Johnson goes down, takes a chance. Santana may drive him in. Davey Johnson, the last man ever to get a base hit off Sandy Koufax. And also, as Met fans recall, he made the last out in the 1969 World Series. Now, I believe Chuck Tanner's coming out. I think what's happening is that somebody is hollering. I don't know if it's Johnson. Or somebody saying that Roden may be doing something to the baseball. So Chuck Tanner out very quickly saying, hey, look, stay off my pitcher. We don't get on there as you stay off ours. He went out and tried to head off John McSherry. Howard Johnson may have said something. We mentioned it earlier that Roden, like a Don Sutton, so many others, is accused of doctoring a pitch. The way the rule reads now, it is much more difficult to throw a spitball. Especially tough to cut a baseball like Sutton was accused of and Roden on his belt buckle or the grommets in his glove. Because the rule reads now that if you throw a ball that is scuffed, even if it's done on an artificial surface, even if somebody else did it or hit the ground, you are responsible for any ball you throw. So Tanner tried to defuse McSherry's talk with Roden right there. Heap is not going. And Johnson manages to spoil another one. Talking about Davy Johnson a moment ago, 
1966 game two last appearance ever for Koufax the Orioles beat him and the last hit was by Johnson game 5 69 World Series right here against Jerry Kuzman Davy Johnson of the Orioles flies to Cleon Jones in left field and that completes the miracle Mets season of 1969 again the payoff this one is lofted down the left field line and it's out of play too. Ask Davey after the game why he didn't run in this situation. I'm sure he'll give you a very logical explanation. You know, he says he might pack it in after the 1986 season. That was written uh, in the national publication. I talked about him to him about it yesterday. He said that wasn't written accurately. He said, I never said that. Here he goes again. They asked for the ball. Here comes Tanner. The gamesmanship is going on now, folks. Don't know if Davey Johnson is yelling out from the dugout. Tanner said, Come on now. Stay off my guys. Ironically, Tanner is one of those along with Sparky Anderson. Sparky was in the National League. Would save baskets of balls that Don Sutton threw with a little scrape mark over National League President Chubb Feeney's signature. Dick Williams was another one. Another one from Roden to Johnson. And the same old story. That's four in a row. So Johnson won't put a limit on it. Davy Johnson I'm speaking of as far as managing the Mets, huh? He said he wasn't good. He said he might walk away from it. He said, but that isn't what I said and it was quoted as having said. I know one thing, if the, the writer who wrote that, if the report of his salary is accurate, $125,000 a year, he deserves a lot more. You ought to be paid the highest of anybody in baseball to manage in this town. Off the fist. He can throw. He's got a good arm. Catch made by Brown. Carter tags, comes down the line and holds. Remember we did a Pittsburgh Cubs game several months back and the team was so lethargic a lot of the old players Joe Brown who's come back as a general manager says for just one year for the Pirates he's gotten rid of a lot of people he thought were a detriment to the ball club. They're a lot livelier now since they've put a little youth in here in fact they had a team on the field last week that averaged about 24 years of age and there's Mike Brown's arm a guy that Gene Mock wanted to play but he had Rupert Jones get so hot he had to play Reggie out in right field. So Brown just sat there. Now Santana will try and pick Carter up. Still at third. Heap at first with two down. And he fouls the breaking pitch away. That's the 36th pitch thrown in this inning by Rick Roden. He's had trouble getting the breaking ball down, hasn't he? Been able to get some hitters out with a fastball. Sinking it a little bit, cutting it. Now they are going to wave. Right fielder Mike Brown in for Rafael Santana. They give Santana acres of ground in left field. Another slow breaking ball outside. It's a sign of a good pitcher. What Roden's going through now. What Gooden did in the first inning, obviously, pitching out and getting out of it with just one run given up. The point I was trying to make is Roden getting by at this point. Trying to stand up a big, big inning. He already scored three, but a big, big inning without his breaking ball. He needs that. They may already have given Gooden too yeah, much room to work betcha. with. And more. Base hit. And it's into that unprotected left field corner. They didn't think he'd pull Roden. Instead, he takes him to left field for a double. It's 4 1 New York. It's almost an example, Bob, of a defense and a pitcher not in coordination with one another. You play the opposite way as though you're going to run either a slider, a cut fastball, or a fastball away, force him to hit late, pitch him outside, play him, and he got a curveball that was down an off-speed pitch that he allowed him to pull against the way the defense was playing. Gooden steps up as the ninth hitter and drives one to deep left, way back and on the track. Wow.
Victory number 22 now seems all but assured. Afterwards, he'll only want to talk about this. Dwight Gooden comes out for an encore. So Tom Seaver at 18 base hits in 1971, and what a way for Dwight Gooden to tie him. That was his 18th, a three-run home run. Now I understand Davey Johnson's strategy. He wanted Gooden to get up to the plate. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to take the bat out of Gooden's hands. A 7-1 lead, and a big smile in the New York dugout. And the glow around this young man shines just a little bit brighter. And a home run is first in the majors to his long list of accomplishments. And moments ago, the curtain call. You know what this does, as you look down the road, this game is far by over with, but Davey Johnson has refused to deviate from his pattern, except for, I think, one time before the All-Star game this year, having Dwight Gooden pitch on the fifth day. But if the lead stands up and you get in the sixth or seventh inning and you want to take him out for a low number of pitches, you can, and then when the pennant race really tightens up, you could come back with him three days rest because he wouldn't throw very many pitches today. But that's a ways down the road. Larry McWilliams in to face Mookie Wilson, and as you can see, McWilliams wastes no time. Give me the ball, and I'm coming right back at you. The Jim Cott style of delivery. Little squibber. Bream comes up with it and puts an end to a seven-run New York first. A six-run cushion. Conservatively, it should be more than enough for that guy. Faces. They're all different, yet these all have something in common. They're the faces of Manville people. Manville people at work, 21,000 of them with one goal, to be America's very best supplier of quality products. Manville people aren't just dedicated to making better products. They're always striving to make those products even better. Yes, 21,000 people with one goal, to make Manville America's very best supplier. When you start something good, everyone wants a piece of it. Take light beer from Miller. Now there's lots of light beers out there saying they're less filling. Heck, that was the easy part. The hard part is brewing a light beer that tastes great. That's why light's always brewed only with the finest ingredients. To let all that great beer taste come through for guys like you and me. The taste that's made light beer for Miller, America's favorite light beer. Hey, I always thought it was easy opening cans. <laughs> I'm Mr. Goodwrench. You know what starts when your engine starts? Engine wear. 50 strokes, 100 strokes, 200 piston strokes of wear per second. Only a fine lubricant can protect it. Like GM Goodwrench Motor Oil, the motor oil from General Motors that meets or exceeds all GM specifications. Great protection for me, Mr. Goodwrench. GM An American tradition continues. In 1969, they were the miracle of New York. Baseball Cinderella champions. They were amazing. Now, Keith Hernandez and Gary Carter lead a new generation of Mets in their drive for the pennant as they face the Pirates or the Cardinals meet the Expos. The tradition is here. The memories are waiting. You think he hasn't been waiting for this moment? He'd been practicing this home run trot. There's the reaction, and he just Cadillacs it around the bases. He put it in cruise control, and it took him about 30 seconds to get around. You think it's a toss-up who the best athlete on this team is? Strawberry or Gooden? It'd be close, wouldn't it? What a pair of talents. Sammy Khalifa. One and one to him. You know, Gooden's hitting is his pride and joy, and he has begged Davey Johnson only half kiddingly to let him bat left handed but of course Johnson won't allow it because they don't want that right arm exposed toward the pitcher. He still takes some BP from the left side on occasion. Sandy Koufax bat right hand left handed thrower. Koufax was a terrible hitter wasn't he. That's what even more of a reason to have him move to the other side. He didn't want to he didn't like seeing the ball coming that way because he grew up from that side of the plate. Goodbye Sammy Khalifa on the curveball. Second strikeout for Dr. K. Be interesting to see what Gooden's pitching pattern comes out to be. There's the K corner. When he gets this breaking ball over, Number 26. it looked like some of these right-handed hitters think home plate is radioactive. They stay away from it. 
interesting to see if he continues to try and power guys away with strikeouts or conserve his pitches and just get balls like this. That was a sinking fastball now with the seams. His last time out, Gooden had a three-pitch inning. He may try for more of those, maybe not get as many strikeouts as people would like so he can save himself for his next start. Number 49. And of course, here's what McWilliams has been looking forward to all weekend. His chance to face Gooden. Perhaps he'd just prefer to mail three strikes in and get back out to the mound. Bottom of the second in St. Louis, Van Slyke and Pendleton both flew out to left field. Porter walked. Ozzie Smith also walked on four pitches. So with two out, they had runners on first and second. Tudor was the hitter, and he fouled out to third after two innings. One nothing Montreal in St. Louis. McWilliams trying to work up the courage to stand in there. Base hit. I take it all back. He sunk another fastball. He's just trying to get a ground ball like he did off the bat of Junior Ortiz. I wouldn't say it's really a sinker. It's a fastball that tails away from a right-hander. And he knows how to keep that kind of pitch down when he throws it. It's just a matter of using the seams to your uh, what you want to make the ball do. That's the second hit the Pirates have managed against Gooden. Here's Orsalak, who reached on Wilson's error and scored an unearned run on the top of the first. He's a threat to bunt. Johnson knows it. He's in on the grass. Hernandez behind the runner McWilliams at first, obviously, with the big lead the Mets have. On it foul. This team needed an infusion of speed. They've got some of that now. Leading rookie hitters, Mark Salas of the Twins, Ernest Riles. Pittsburgh's Joe Arcelak. Riles, a pretty good looking young ball player, isn't he? Shortstop for the Brewers. Good looking hitter. He's been making a lot of errors that have been hurting them uh, as far as the opposition scoring. I think he will smooth out his play, though. Couldn't hit it any harder, and Santana couldn't have been positioned any better. After one and a half, it's Gooden and the Mets, 7 1. Sammy Khalifa, the young shortstop. First played some Little League ball in the sands of Tripoli and Egyptian shores and stuff. His father, a scholar, a Muslim scholar, had something to do with the conversion of Ahmad Rajad. And in fact, Khalifa's dad is named Ahmad. And that is why Ahmad Rashad took that name. Well, Backman's going to try it against a tough left-handed pitcher, Larry McWilliams, with that quick delivery. He's gone away from switch hitting one day in his frustration. He went into Davey John said, do you mind? Davey said, if you think you can handle it, go ahead. He was hitting only 148 for the year right-handed when he went up against Steve Trout a few days ago from the left side, and he stated it flatly. He's abandoned switch hitting. It's left-handed all the way. Not just an experiment anymore. Ran up as if to bunt and took ball two. And it's something how the careers of a Don Kessinger and Maury Wills because they became switch hitters. Bill Russell tried switch hitting in the lower minor leagues. Didn't work for me. Went back. Now they're talking about Mariano Duncan. Dominican shortstop from the Dodgers. Making him a one-way hitter again like he started out. So for some it doesn't work. I don't know if it's a psychological block. Something physical. If you don't believe in it. It's not going to work for you. A little tapper. Khalifa comes in. And throws Backman out. Andre Dawson just hit a grand slam for the Expos. They are all over John Tudor. 5 nothing in the top half of the third, Montreal. So, if the scores hold up at Bush Stadium and here at Shea, the Mets will again move to within one of the Redbirds. That's in the third, not in the second. Third inning, 5 nothing Montreal. Hernandez had a walk in the first. You'll see guys step out of the batter's box a lot against McWilliams simply because he works so quickly that the hitters often don't feel comfortable. They want to get themselves set. One and one. Out of the Atlanta Braves organization, McWilliams. Blue Jays were interested in him at one time when they were short of some left-handed pitchers. Now Jimmy Key's come along. He wins again yesterday. 
Well, he's tough. He drops down with that curveball from the side. His fastball's on you in a hurry. Johnny Sane, when he was a pitching coach for Chuck Tanner, they got Jim Cott to do it to get his career back on beam. Cott did it, and of course Tanner then has tried it since with McMill McWilliams, who has started, pitched in relief for him. Full count now to Hernandez. So John Tudor proves fallible after all. Even though he beat the Pirates last Monday in Pittsburgh, Bill Allman hit a grand slam against him. And Dawson hits the jackpot today. A called third strike to Hernandez. Drops down from the side instead of the curveball. Looked like he threw the fastball right down on the outer edge. As a left-handed hitter against a guy like McWilliams, you have the tendency to say, well, if he drops down from the side, I'm going to look breaking ball. Sweeping, which he had thrown him earlier in the count. This is a fastball, and Hernandez couldn't register and pull the trigger. Another thing that Davey Johnson can do as this game progresses, if the lead holds up, he can give Carter some needed rest, I would think. The score was just popped up on the board that Bob Cotton just told you about. They're watching that red dot here, aren't they, and Shea? It pops from team to team, up and down. Who's batting? What inning? Last night, the scoreboard taunted the Mets and their fans. It was already up there that the Cardinals had come from behind to beat the Expos as the game slipped away here against the Pirates in 11 innings. Foul ball. Many times you will see Gary Carter swing and miss, and the right leg will give in. He's had to make his swing a little bit shorter and quicker. He's had to adjust his stance. That bothered him last season at the end of the season, his right knee. It's pretty much stiff-legged. He's opened the stance. No, he first injured that knee playing high school football. Despite that fact, he was still recruited by several schools, including UCLA. They wanted him to play quarterback. Foul back toward us. You know, I think since he went for that stance, he's changed a little. He used to be an outstanding low ball hitter, and he still does. But he's hit some pitches last night up in the strike zone. He used to try and run the ball in on his fist upstairs, and at times you'd have trouble with it. But standing up straighter because of that right knee, I think he's hitting high ball better. So there is a benefit to it, I think. Full count to him now. Houston had their nine game winning streak snapped by the Reds last night. Suddenly Cincinnati's just four and a half back of the Dodgers. That's out of play down the right field line. Cincinnati won eight of their last ten. But Los Angeles has lost seven of its last ten. My vote goes to Rose no matter what happens the rest of the way for manager of the year. With a lot of stars to guys like Herzog and Lasorda. But boy with what what Pete has had to build that team what he's had to go through. Mm. A two out walk to Carter. You know the Reds have three games remaining at Los Angeles the last three of the regular season. They looked meaningless about a week ago. Now they might be pressure ball games. Tom Not Browning. too much pressure on Gooden right now with the 7 1 lead. Tom Browning a rookie who's gone unnoticed an excellent chance to win 20 ball games this year. He's going to get four or five more starts. Strawberry drives one into left center field but Reynolds will be there short of the track to put it away. Strawberry has tremendous opposite field power. You hold your breath every time he goes that way. We'll be right back after these messages from your local station. It's the season premiere of Pirates. Pirates have been out of the National League East cellar only one day since April of 1984. Wholesale changes are in order and Chuck Tanner and Joe Brown have made them during the course of this season. They've either traded or sold people like John Candelaria, Doug Froebel, George Hendrick, Al Holland, Bill Madlock, Rod Scurry, Kent to Colby. They released Tim Foley. They got Sid Bream, Mike Brown, Pat Clements, the left hander, Bob Kipper, who starts tomorrow, and R.J. Reynolds in deals. Also, Cecil Espy came over from the Dodgers in that Madlock transaction. They've called several players, guys like Khalifa and Gonzalez, up from the minor league. So they're trying to reshape the ball club. How many players you say they've had this year? 43? Something like that. 43 yeah. players have been on this roster. That's movement. That's movement, too. Strike one. 
Pirates have won just 17 ball games on the road this year. 17 wins, 52 losses. Gooden knows how to change speeds on his curveball. Something that it takes some veterans to get their late 20s to learn how to do. In left field, Heap, with the shades drawn, makes the catch for the first out as we check with Len Berman for an update. Len? Well, Bob, here's that home run you talked about. Top of the third, Andre Dawson, who was slumping, crushes a grand slam for the Expos. So is John Tudor about to lose his first game since June 20th. 5-0 Montreal, bottom of the third inning now in St. Louis. Back to Shea. All right, Len and John Tudor trying to join Joaquin Andahar as a 20-game winner for the Cardinals. Ray slaps this one to short. Santana on the high hop. That's the second out. No team in the National League has had two 20-game winners since 1969 when the Cubs had a pair in Ferguson, Jenkins, and Bill Hands, and so did the Dodgers in Bill Singer and Claude Osteen. So Tudor will have more opportunities even if he doesn't get it today. A guy like Gooden, I would imagine, is not uncomfortable to bat against. Laura was Koufax. I mean, they might strike you out three times in the game, but their deliveries are so fluid and so smooth, and they generally have, I mean, they don't throw balls behind you and right at you. You get a guy, a guy like Herb Scar, Ryan Duran, of course, he was a relief pitcher. Drysdale. Drysdale didn't throw hard like these guys. He was sinker ball. He'd knock you down, I mean, if he had to, and go slider away. And Sam McDowell and Herb score. They had wicked curveballs. They never knew where the ball was going. They had different release points all the time. Over the top, sidearm, three quarters. So you couldn't pick up the ball too often. When you faced Koufax in game one of the 63 series, had you ever seen anything like it? No. A pleasant three strikeouts. And you didn't strike out that often. Neither did Bobby Richardson. Neither did Roger Maris. Now Mickey did, as you well know. In fact, about the fourth time Koufax was on the brink of breaking the record. I think he got Harry Bright, a right-handed pitcher, for the last out. Mickey went up there and said, I better go up there without a bat. You guys are striking out. No sense of me even taking one up there. But he did hit a home run off Koufax in that series. And they applaud in anticipation of strike three and don't get it. Shallow left. Santana back. Heap in. And it's Danny Heap. No strikeouts, but a 1-2-3 inning for Gooden, who has fanned two so far and who leads 7-1. Met attendance isn't just a franchise record, it's a New York City baseball attendance record, including the Yankees, the Dodgers, the Giants. And they'll likely surpass it this season with four more home dates remaining after this one. So now are the Yankees in a late game losing streak. The Mets have taken over the town, haven't they? Boy, they pulled the trap door on Billy Martin's wow. team in a hurry, didn't they? Less than a week ago or about a week ago, they were riding high. Strike one to Heap. McWilliams in relief of Roden, who departed after yielding seven first inning runs. and Gonzalez is in foul ground as he clutches it. I think it's interesting how many people are taking pot shots at Billy Martin. And I guess Billy brings so much on himself. I understand some of the reports I read. He was in a little bit of a shoving match with somebody who was antagonizing him after a ball game yesterday the day before. When you figure that Billy Martin really had just four pitchers on that staff most of the year he could rely on, Gidry, Necro, Rigetti, and Fisher, to have them in the pennant race as long as he did was an amazing job of managing. The only two reliable starters. You bet. Third, fourth, and fifth guys, very inconsistent. Now, of course, he's being questioned for letting Pagliarulo bat right-handed, switch it early in his career. Here's a drive off Johnson's bat that Orsalak will back up on and take. Folks, this telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball, even though we know those of you with VCRs like to tape Gooden's performances, just show it to your family and friends and don't charge them anything and you'll be all right. Interesting to see pitchers the day they pitch, up to a couple of hours before a ball game. Ron Darling yesterday was very intense, hardly talked to anybody. Gooden today was very relaxed. 
You can see him just when he got the bat, he's going up there and he said something to somebody on the bench with a big smile. Probably something like that. I'm going for back to back home runs. Which with his athletic ability, you never know. Something I like about this Met Ball Club, not only are they obviously a good team in contention right down to the wire with the Cardinals. This one's out of play off Santana's bat. But there is a sense of joy around this ball club. The youngsters like Strawberry and and Gooden and a guy with Carter's spirit make it so. There's a buoyancy in that clubhouse. And I think especially in light of some of the things that surround modern baseball we tend to become cynical but these guys are enjoying the experience of this pennant race. Hey, how about cross town. Even when those guys were in a pennant race after they split the first two games with Toronto and Yankee Stadium some were talking about wanting to be traded. They were still close at that time. The Toronto Blue Jays. Yeah in contrast the Yankee attitude is grim. Gooden put one over R.J. Reynolds glove and just over the wall and left for his first big league homer his last time. You think there were some great pitching prospects came out of that area in Tampa right near Hillsborough High School with about a mile. Vance Lovelace is going to be a good looking left hander Dodgers on him. Look at this guy. Another bullet but Gonzalez somehow hauls huh. it in. Gooden's in a groove both on the mound and at the plate. Still at least so far tilted a bit more than usual toward the heat and Bob that 26 fastballs can be deceiving and I mean in this regard he does three different things with his fastball so that's three different pitches although his delivery and release points stay constant he doesn't drop down but he has the riding fastball the four seamer the cut fastball that runs into the fists of a left hander and then he has thrown a few more of the last inning trying to get ground balls with the seams to make it run away or sink. Mike Brown's ground out produced the Pirate run in the first. Started to list some of the pitchers that came from the neighborhood in Tampa that Gooden pitched in and played some third base. Vance Lovelace, a six foot six inch left hander, belongs to the Dodgers. Rich Monteleone belongs to the Tigers, a hard thrower. McCullers from San Diego is from that neighborhood. Floyd Yeoman played on the same team with him. And of course, Gooden played third base, as we said, when Floyd Yeomans pitched. So that's about five guys with outstanding arms from that little bitty area of Tampa. There's the curveball. It's too late now, probably, but the Yankees lead Baltimore 2 0. Now the Yankees have to play three games up in Exhibition Stadium, Toronto, at the end of the year. One nothing Milwaukee over Toronto Milwaukee with a lot of new faces here with BJ Billy Joe Robodeau got his first major league home run the other day. Great looking prospect. The rhythmic applause every time Gooden gets two strikes on a hitter one and two the count holding to Brown. The praise has come from everywhere Koufax I'd rather have his future than my past Nolan Ryan no comparison at this stage of Gooden's career and when I was the same age he's complete I was incomplete. Gidry, he'll strike out 4,000. Billy Martin, he'd be even better in the American League because they'd give him a high strike. The 1 2 to Brown. Gooden, for his part, in a fashion, returned the compliment to Nolan Ryan the first time he batted against Noli. He came back to the dugout and told his teammates, Now I know what it must be like to face me. <laughs> Is battling him. He threw a fastball, the pitch before this last one, that he was way late. This and he started to catch up on just a little bit as Gooden put a little bit extra on the ball, and he's got him set up for a curveball right now, but we'll see what he goes to. Can you afford to guess at all with no, Gooden? Yeah, you've got to guess against him. Fastball every time. That's what you got to guess. Now he claims, Gooden, that Steve Garvey hits him well, guesses and guesses right. Guys that hit him well, Willie McGee, Bill Dorn, Chili Davis, 
I mean, they hit him at a 400 or better clip along with Garvey. You know, there's another guy who's done fairly well against him, Pete Rose. Mm -hmm. Rose is six for 20 against Gooden. Breaking ball off the outside corner, and the count is full. You've got to look for his hardest pitch. Unless he gets behind you 2-0 and oh or 2-1, and one, and then if you want to guess curveball, you'd be silly to start with. Out of play again. He does something, and I remember Koufax delivery. Now, you try to compare him to certain pitchers, and Davey Johnson, some male style, he has the coil of a Bob Gibson, the way he tucks the left knee when he gets to that position. Some people say Jim Palmer because of the extension over the top. I don't think he extends quite as far as Jim Palmer. He throws a lot higher. Of course, you never can tell, but the odds are that Gooden is not the kind of guy who would have a sore arm. Brown reached for what might have been ball four. Anything can happen, but when you look at his motion, People remark about how fluid it is, and generally that keeps you away from arm difficulties. Watch his front side. Now, the, here's the part, the coil they talk about is like Bob Gibson's. But when his foot hits, he hits against a firm front side. Almost builds up a torque to resist. Doesn't have the lower body action of a Ryan or a Seaver, not quite that low. He walked it. That's the second walk issued by Gooden, and Brown earned it, fouling off several pitches. You look at the good hitters, whether it's Brett or Carew or Boggs, they hit against the firm front side like a good tennis player or golfer. They don't let that front side collapse. How is a mechanics to be that sound at this age is incredible. Maybe he's Roy Hobbs. Maybe he's the natural. What was the Plimpton story? Not the phenom through left, right, 145 miles an hour. Yeah, Sid Finch. Sid Finch. Here he is. A lot of people bought that story. That tongue-in-cheek tale Jay, back in April in Sports Illustrated. Jay Horowitz, the PR man here. Mel Stoudemire went around along with a little ways. Oh, and two. Yankees tack on another one, but they trail Toronto by six and a half in the East. And it's just not that good and can throw strikes. I mean, just getting the ball in that little rectangular box for strikes. He can control the strike zone. He just did it with that pitch, a cut fastball, low and away. Good block by Carter. As soon as Gonzalez does something one way or another, we'll recap the recent action in St. Louis, where the Expos have a 5 nothing lead on the Cardinals. Mets count on a Gooden victory. Should Tudor lose for the Cardinals, it'd be an unexpected bonus. Hit to third. Johnson, tough hop, whirls around, gets the force, and that's all. Okay, here's what happened in St. Louis in the bottom of the third. Coleman and McGee each flew out. This time he took something off a curveball. When it was 0 and 2 to Gonzalez, he threw a hard curveball, tried to strike him out. Then he pulled the string and had Gonzalez out in front. Bob? As I was saying, Tommy Hur then doubled to left center and Jack Clark came up, but he too flew out to left field to end the inning. 5 0 Montreal after three. Then in the top of the fourth, Tudor struck out Sal Butera and Bill Gullickson. And also Tim Raines. So he struck out the side in the top of the fourth. Montreal with the 5 0 lead as they go to the bottom half of that inning in St. Louis. Tudor is due to be the fifth man up in the bottom of the fourth for the Cardinals. So if Whitey Herzog gets a rally of some kind going there, he might pinch hit for Tudor. We'll keep an eye on it. 0 2 pitch. Strikeout number three. And the second time he's gotten Khalifa. Chuck Tanner's getting his bullpen up. There's kind of a code of ethics, if you will, among managers. Mike Belitsky or Balecki, if you want to do anglicize it. He's up. Or Balecki. 
Wait a minute. Let's settle on one here. I'm going to do it like my mom, born in Poland with friends, Delitsky. Let's do it by lucky, okay? You can handle that. By lucky is it. Okay, you can handle that. Anyway, this Sparky Anderson was very upset that he didn't help Billy Martin, the Yankees, out when Toronto swept Detroit up at Exhibition Stadium. So Sparky turned around and did a job on the Yankees. Same what Tanner would like to do. It's kind of an unwritten code. So even though the way down to Dwight Gooden, he's going to pinch it when he's supposed to, run the game like it's supposed to be run. He'll run his whole staff out there if he has to. There goes the runner from first, and Carter will just let him steal it. That's the kind of stuff that Sandy Koufax didn't like when you stole on him. He had a slow delivery. In fact, wasn't the only guy he ever admitted throwing out on purpose, Lou Brock. Sandy said, I didn't like that at all. We were, don't throw at anybody. However, I don't like you stealing when the game's out of hand. got to be a little different though stealing when you're behind 7-1 yeah. if they give it to you than if you're ahead 7-1 you're certainly not rubbing it in you're just trying to get back in the game 2-0 pitch coming fastball foul back now you take a run whenever you can get it against anybody but especially Dwight Gooden he's gotten rattled all over the place it seems like when you're battling injuries and you're a catcher that the ball finds you even more frequently. He got hit into the toes last night. Balls off the shoulders. That one off the mask. I don't well, know how he's been able to sustain the hitting that he's done over the last 19 games with all the home runs. Ortiz is a member of that catching fraternity, and he was sympathizing with Carter as Gary tried to pull himself back together. One. It's supposed to rain here today. It's getting a little bit cloudy. There's a little bit of a haze this morning, but now wind is just picking up a little bit, not strongly, out to center field. This is a very fair. There are the flags blowing high atop the stadium, blowing out to center field, but not by very much. But this is a very fair park for hitters and pitchers. Night baseball, especially. You've got to hit the ball well to get it out of here. The night against the Cubs, both Carter and Strawberry at tape measure jobs. Strawberry, as they say, the right center field went about 475 feet. 410 to dead center. No park can hold some of the shots Strawberry has unloaded mm. the past month or so. The Cardinals have a run in the fourth. We'll tell you about it in a minute. A chopper, Santana, from the outfield grass. Got him. He knew he was running a catcher, so he just set his right foot and flipped it over. The Pirates leave a man and still trail seven. The gap is two. The Cardinals with the lead, 15 to play. And if you're just joining us, three remaining head to head. They're in St. Louis. Midweek games, October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. And also, if you're just joining us, the Mets sent 10 to the plate in the first, capped off by a three-run home run by Dwight Gooden, his first major league home run. And so you have to say that he's the odds-on favorite for the light beer from Miller player of the game, which we'll select at the conclusion of the game. After Mookie Wilson came back from those shoulder miseries, and he hits this one toward the hole, and even had Khalifa come up with it. He never would have thrown Wilson out. So Mookie is now one for two with a walk. He said, I've got an awful lot of energy ready to be wasted on somebody. I've been sitting around waiting for my chance, and he's been a tiger since he's come back. Well, as Davey Johnson said last week, we were up in Montreal. He's my hacker. He goes up there swinging. He might swing at a grounder, but he can get you the extra base hits that Dykstra wasn't able to. He can run the ball down and the little shoulder, still not at full strength. Can be very valuable that last 15 games. You know, it's an interesting thing, though, about Wilson, the hitting instructor and first base coach, Bill Robinson. Backman tries to drag one. McWilliams fields it, and he'll tag him, so he'll get credit, probably for a sacrifice. The official scorer doesn't have to give it to him because of the game situation, but likely he will. 
it's one of those plays where with a six run lead if you square around a bunt and you sure you're obviously giving you up it might get a pitcher a little bit mad at you for trying to pad the lead and get a runner in scoring position so Backman wisely tries to drag it make it look like he's trying to beat it out for a base hit but he'll probably be given a sacrifice just to finish the thought about Wilson Bill Robinson thinks that the shoulder injury has caused Mookie even if it's unconsciously to shorten his swing and it's trimmed those strikeouts a little bit ball one to Hernandez that's always been a weakness for Wilson he strikes out too much he's made better contact since his return so the situations are Hernandez cuts down his string a swing just tries to go up the middle look for a pitch that might be a mistake hanging breaking ball from McWilliams he's one of the smartest players in the game not just defensively but with a bat in his hands you look situations the game the count look at series of pitches he knows what McWilliams got him out with the last time a fastball right out there in the outside part of the plate the good hitters catalog things and they come back to haunt the opposition pitcher 3 0 pitch swinging on it drives it to the opposite field R.J. Reynolds over toward the line backhands it on the track and Wilson returns to second Catcher. with two out now now that was the pitch that McWilliams got him out on the last time struck him out in the second and it looked like he was just sitting on it say OK you want to stay out there that's where you're going to pitch me I'm going to just go the opposite way but they had him defense that way also by the way Backman was not credited with a sacrifice on that drag bunt the official score saw it as an attempt for a hit good. all the way I think it's Red Foley I'm not certain or Maury Allen but I think it's a good call you got a six run lead of course you got to give a in a little bit to Backman because he isn't used to hitting left hand against left handed pitchers very often now they're going to intentionally walk Carter to get the left hander strawberry let me tell you something strawberry has punished some left handed pitchers this year and there's the straw man there's the fourth one high and wide and a strawberry strides to the plate we head to our studios here in New York to check with Len Berman. Len? Well, Bob, bottom of the fourth, here's the run you talked about. The Cards getting on the board against Bill Gullickson. Darrell Porter's fly ball to right. And here comes Van Slyke. He scores it. So it's now 5-1 Expos as they play the bottom of the fifth inning. All right, Bob, back to you. Thanks, Len. First one to Strawberry is a called strike. Maybe Harry Coyle can get us a shot of that home run cap out beyond the center field fence. That's a little celebration they set up here. When someone hits a home run, a big apple comes out of the top. Off speed pitch inside. There's the apple. He hit one in there against That's the right. Cubs. Some thought it went over, but went it in there, but they figured 450 to 475. Right into the hat and on top of the apple. One of many monstrous strawberry homers took something off and he was out in front. Bob since uh, strawberry came back from the thumb injury and he's had to leave ball games periodically because it still bothers him when he did the tumble on the catch and jammed it tore up some uh, cartilage. He moved closer to the plate and I think that's enabled him to handle left handers better. He can reach their curve balls cover the outside part of the plate and still it's difficult to throw the ball by him inside. And that was a job that Bill Robinson had to say you're so good and so quick. Get up on the plate. At second base, Ray. Lots of time, and that'll do it. So both clubs have been silent offensively since the first, but that's when the Mets made lots of noise back after the bar today. Although the Mets haven't missed his bat, leading 7-1. Here's Davey Johnson's version of a horror show. That's the play on which Strawberry injured the right thumb. You can see him grimacing in pain. And he missed some seven weeks. Despite that fact, he's got 25 home runs for the year. Top of the fifth at Bush Stadium. Vance Law lined to right. Andre Dawson grounded a third, and Hubie Brooks struck out. The sixth strikeout for Tudor as he sets the side down in order. Bill Allman, the pinch hitter here. And on the first pitch, it's a chance for Strawberry. Crosses into foul ground to make the catch. And now Allen goes five for 13 on the season as a pinch hitter. Strawberry someday may win a triple crown. We talk about the Murphys, Guerreros, 
But I think of all the players playing today, he's a guy that could win the batting championship, RBI championship. He could steal you 30, 40 bases if they let him go and will someday. He's got to stay healthy. No question he could be a 40 home run guy. Easy. Easy? I mean, how many hit 40? That's not that easy. I meant to say it is easily within his capabilities. I mean, you'd have yes. to say if everything came together some year, he could hit 45 to 50. Fastball misses 2 and 0. We uh. understand that in the bottom of the fifth, Steve Braun pinch hit for John Tudor. So Tudor is done in St. Louis, and he leaves on the short end of a 5 1 score. months ago the Pirates and Chuck Tanner but Al Manchak up one of his longtime coaches in the world of the minor leagues just to work with guys like Orslak and his base stealing Sammy Khalifa making the double play and charging the ball work with a lot of the young kids Manchak such a great fundamentalist he's invited up to be around for a couple of weeks he stayed almost two months three oh three and one let me ask you a question how long did the hula hoop stay in vogue it is still in vogue in some parts of the country. Like or disco are, music. Are you going to relate this to the... Uh, well, I'm just hoping that uh, eventually this wave will uh, play itself out as other silly trends sometimes do. The thing about it, you've got a guy like Gooden on the mound where you're fooling around, waiting to see the wave come so you can time it. You're missing what this young man's doing. I don't know why people want to do it when this guy's on the mound. R.J. Reynolds. Houston and Cincinnati at the Dome. The Reds to within four and a half of the Dodgers in the National League West. Al Rosen, of course, Houston Astros general manager has left. He's in San Francisco. Rumors that that team may be moved to Denver. Rumors with the Pirates. Chuck, not a rumor. Chuck Tanner has gotten a group together, already made an offer to Mr. Galbraith to buy the ball club with some concessions from the city regarding the leasing and all else. Interesting to see what happens. I understand the mayor, Mayor Caligieri, I guess is the way it's pronounced, has got a group. Of his own. So Tanner did this once before the White Sox, Raleigh Heeman, and another group. He wants to buy the Pirates now. Some people say the Pirate franchise is finished, will never, never get back on his feet again. I don't know if that's true. Two and one to R.J. Reynolds. Number 34 to the left of Davey Johnson, Sam Perlazzo, one of their minor league managers, been up the last week, sitting next side from Davey Johnson. Davey honestly has said, I don't fear my job. You've got a suggestion during the course of the game of the pennant race. Give it to me. I may use it. Gooden falls behind three and one. Joe McIlvain, the director of player personnel here, along with Steve Shriver, farm director. They've got some good kids in the minor leagues. Four of their six minor league teams are in the playoff. Two of the Mets minor league teams out of those four were in the finals in the playoffs, so they've got some kids coming. Up the middle, and that's base hit number two on the day for R.J. Reynolds. It's like a batting practice fastball. The Orioles have thrown for so many years. You get behind, you got a big lead, and say, here, hit it. I'd rather have you hit it and put it in play, take a chance on my fielders, than, have, than walk you. One of those Met farm teams you mentioned, Tony, beat the Yankees AAA affiliate for the International League title. Tidewater topping Columbus couple of names to remember. Sean Abner, which is 301, 301, 16 home runs, 80 RBIs, 88 RBIs, MVP in the Carolina League. And a young shortstop, Kevin Elster, who's moving up fast. A ball, the double A ball. They say this kid Elster is about 6'1". Buddy Harrelson had him his first year in the minor leagues. They say that he could be here next year with a few good months in triple A ball next year. He may be their shortstop next season if he keeps progressing. So Frank Cashin has put an organization together here. Reynolds diving back. Cardinals go out in order in the bottom of the fifth. Braun bats for Tudor, grounds to short. Coleman flies to right. And McGee fouls out to third. After five, it's 5-1 five Montreal, and Tudor is gone. One and one. Sid Bream is next 
if Ray keeps the inning alive. The Pirates second from the bottom in team batting in the National League only San Francisco with a lower team batting average. Pirates the lowest number of runs scored. Fewest number of home runs in the National League. They have hit just 70. The third from the bottom in team pitching in the National League. Chicago and Atlanta beneath them. Chicago's got a legit, legitimate excuse though. Five starters at one time or another down with injuries. And of course the Atlanta Braves too. They had four of their starters down and disabled. So Eddie Haas had the lead and Bobby Wine's doing a good job. This has not been good and light control today. He's been behind quite a few hitters. Perhaps the intensity of this pennant race and jumping off to the big lead. He may have relaxed a little bit. Really isn't pitching with the intensity that he does most often. Well hit by Johnny Ray Mookie Wilson on his horse and Mookie will be there a stride or two in front of the warning track. And that does it in the Pittsburgh fifth. No runs a hit and a man is left. 7-1 after four and a half. Not quite a sellout but not many empty seats at Shea Stadium in New York. The Mets as we go to the bottom of the fifth leading it seven to one and now Mike Bilecki is the third Pittsburgh pitcher. Rick Roden faced nine hitters. The ninth was Dwight Gooden who launched his first career homer over the fence and left. That made it seven one and that's where we stand now. McWilliams did a good job after replacing Roden both on the mound and at the plate he singled against Gooden and is only at bat. Allman hit for him in the top of the fifth and now Bilecki. Danny Heap lofts the first one into shallow left. R.J. Reynolds wants it and has it. Len Berman is standing by now in New York. He has an update for us. Bob, top of the sixth in Houston. Buddy Bell hits it deep to left. Jose Cruz runs out of room. It's a two-run homer. The Reds take the lead four to three. Pete Rose scoring on the play. He had singled career hit number 4,200 for Pete. All right, Bob, back to you. Thanks, Len. Howard Johnson gloops one over the head of Denny Gonzalez. Might be extra bases. On his way to second, and Reynolds fumbles it. Probably won't be charged with an error. Johnson would have made second anyway. Johnson let up a little bit when he saw he had a sure double between first and second. He kind of started cruising in. Had he run hard all the way with the play in front of him, he might have been able to go to third, even though it would have been a short throw. Little squibber. Johnson runs hard. Then he says, I think I'll cruise in. That's when the ball got by and it was too late to reaccelerate to get the third. Balecki. One win, three losses, ERA about five and a half. And his tenth game this season for the Pirates. He's started six ball games. Santana has an RBI double and a walk. Takes a strike. Another run for the Expos. Kurt Kepshire, who was bumped from the starting rotation a few days ago in Philadelphia when Whitey Herzog went with Matt Keough up from the minors trying to come back from the rotator cuff injury. Kepshire comes on to relieve Tudor in the sixth. A little squiver down to second. Ray pounds the glove, gathers it in, and throws him out. That's been a problem for Whitey a good part of the season for finding those four and five starters. Han Duhar, Danny Cox. So now Johnson is a third with two out on the reception for Gooden. In St. Louis, after Kepshire got Tim Wallach to fly out to right, Andy Galarraga, the young first baseman, hit his first big league homer over the wall in center field, and that's a poke at Bush Stadium. 6 1 the score now in favor of the Expos. Do you get the feeling that when we do a game with Gooden on the mound that everything is always secondary. I forget there's anybody else on the field. I mean he's such a captivating pitcher and personality and the story is so great. Look at this. Another base hit. It's 8 1 New York and Gooden is two for three and the only time they retired him he hit a blue dart at Gonzalez at third base. Down the stretch the day he's not pitching they ought to do like they do in high school or little league baseball bat and clean up. <laughs> <laughs> he got another breaking ball. That's what he hit deep off Rick Roden. He hit a three-run home run in the first inning. 
off a hanging curve ball. He got a breaking ball again. So he obviously is one pitcher you can't just say, hey, here. Most pitchers say put a little bit of spin on the ball and they're gone. But not with Gooden. He now owns the Met record. That's his 19th hit of the season, most ever by a Met pitcher. Tom Seaver had 18 hits in 1971. Good one of that baseball. He asked for it. They threw in the dugout. That'll go in his trophy case. So at just age 20, he's broken Seaver's record, as you said. He is so proud of his hitting, isn't he? And he ought to be. But he's done already today. He's had three two-hit games this year, including his last two outings. Did it against the Phillies several days ago. And didn't he have a three-hit game against Valenzuela? Did a screwball, curveball, and fastball in one ball game. Three-hit ball game off. Fernando, some said might have been a better hitter, and Fernando said afterwards, nope, I give in. Goody's the better hitter of the two of us. So Gooden's gotten them in bunches. Remember last week when we were standing with Davy Johnson before the game up in Montreal, and he was saying he's the best hitter in the ball club, and Johnson, no, Fernandez is, you don't drive in any runs. A couple days after that, he drove in two runs. He's done it again today. Checks his swing and it might find a home. No, Reynolds comes over and takes it in as it hung up. A run on the RBI single by Gooden. Here's another edition of Baseball Remembers. Old Spice presents Baseball Remembers of Lou Gehrig Day. They retired the number of Lou Gehrig. A very famous day, July 4th, 1939. It became the first old-timers game because a lot of his old teammates uh, had come. And they were really saying goodbye to Lou. And Lou knew he was saying goodbye. Jay, Jay, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. I want to dry eye in the house. I can almost hear the ovation right now. Seemed like it never ends. And Tony Kubak, back at Shea Stadium, an interesting remark you made, especially coming from somebody like you, because you're so attentive to all the details on the field normally, but a guy like Gooden will rivet your attention on him alone. The only thing he's got left to do today, or this year in my life, is do what Rich Gedman did up in Boston against Toronto. Drove in seven runs on Wednesday and hit for the cycle. Gooden now needs, and it seems like nothing is impossible for the kid. All he needs is a triple and a double now, huh? <laughs> you know, your remark about forgetting other people yeah. around the field uh... brings to mind the famous essay. You are tuned to WLVZ Channel 2 Bangor and W57AQ Callas. Titled, I believe, Hub Fans Bid Kid Adieu. And he said that every time Williams came to the plate in the middle of an otherwise dreary Boston order, it was like you were riffling through a bunch of old magazine covers and a Rembrandt had been wedged in between and it went by at high speed and you said, hold it, this is something special. And that's what Gooden is like out there on and the field. And Ted Williams, as I recall, was 42 years old when he hit that last home run. We're looking at a 20-year-old. You just saw some numbers and how his stats compare first two years against, well, the greats in the Hall of Fame. Seaver will be there. He duplicated the win total for the first couple of years that Gooden had, but not the... He lost more and his ERA was higher. Sid Bream leading it off in the sixth. The Pirate three-game winning streak. The only time they put three victories back-to-back -back this year. Indefinite jeopardy. Popped up. Johnson over for a look. He'll run out of room. But not for lack of trying. leading six to one the Expos have the bases loaded now in the top of the sixth at St. Louis following the Galarraga Homer Mitch Webster walked Sal Butera singled Gullickson sacrifice second and third two out they walked Reigns intentionally and now Vance Law has grounded a third so they're out of the inning the Expos leading six one after five and a half Kepshire was roughed up and quickly departed and Bill Campbell has become the third Cardinal pitcher so things are breaking in New York's direction so far this afternoon. Rusty Staub had a big pinch hit last night in the three-run seventh inning rally. 
He started slowly in the pitch hitting department over his last dozen at bats. Rusty's contributed a lot. Gooden has fanned three. And Bream will not be the fourth victim. It's heap and left. And it's one out. I don't believe, except for a couple of occasions, that Gooden is really trying for strikeouts in this ballgame. From what I've seen of his fastball, he's going to get his share just naturally without even trying. And I, you know that when he gets runners on second and third, less than two outs, or late in the ball game in a close game, he can blow people away. It seems almost at will. But he hasn't thrown that crisp fastball that we've seen, and I've had a chance, I know you have, Bob, a couple of times when he's pitched, to sit down behind home plate to see how awesome he can be. There is one of the hardest pitches he threw, that pitch up in the strike zone. Tried to get hit with a very hard fastball. Last year, he set a single season major league record by averaging 11.4 strikeouts per nine innings pitched. He's at about 8.9 per nine innings of work this year, so he's tapered off just a little bit. And of course, Sid Fernandez on the same staff who beat the Cubs the other day, struck out a bunch again, has the highest strikeout to innings pitch ratio in the major leagues. In fact, Sid Fernandez gives up fewer hits for nine innings than Gooden, and that's a surprise. I mean, Gooden's got like about 70 less hits than innings pitched already this season. Dave Steve is one of the best in that department, not the best the last few years in the American League. 2-1 pitch. Another fastball evens the count at 2-2. Two two. Bud Harrelson, now the third base coach, member of those Met teams in 69 and 73 that went to the World Series. He replaced Bobby Valentine on the lines of third when Bobby became the Ranger manager. He just got a great award that I'm sure he's proud of the other day named after the late Gil Hodges the former Met manager. His contribution to baseball. Ed Lynch was scheduled to pitch tomorrow for the Mets. He's got problems with pain in his hip and lower back and he'll miss at least one start. Terry Leach scheduled to pitch again. He gave him a good start in that doubleheader up in Montreal last Friday night. Yeah, it'll be Terry Leach, who is 3-0 as a starter this year for Davey Johnson. Bob Kipper, youngster, will go for Chuck Tanner. After that, 10 of the remaining 13 games for the Mets will be on the road. Slow breaking ball is high, and the count is full, included in those 13 remaining games, the three head-to-head -head with the Cardinals in St. Louis. You forget the other part of this one-two tandem for the Mets. Ron Darling, who's 16 and five, combined Gooden and Darling, 37 wins, nine losses. A little pop. Backman retreats and has it. Two outs in the top of the sixth. Against the Cardinals here at Shea Stadium about 10 days ago, the Mets won two out of three. The Cardinals, of course, are a much better club in their home environment and playing on that artificial surface which so aids their speed game. Gooden's all but put her in low gear folks. He's just I mean he still throws hard still breaking off curveballs but he's just saying here with the lead I've got put it in play. He knows he's smart enough to know even at 20 that the Pirates are not a home run hitting ball club and this is a very fair park for pitchers and hitters. You've got to hit it well to get it out of here. So he's saying put it in play. It'll maybe save me some pitches. I don't have to exert myself by trying to strike out a dozen or so. One oh pitch to Denny Gonzalez. Fastball high. Eight of the ten road games the Mets will play before the end of the regular season are on artificial surface, including, of course, the three in St. Louis. The Mets are two games under 500 for the year on the phony turf. Could be a factor. Up and in. Three and zero. Oh. Interesting. You talked to some of the Pirates before the ball game. Former Met Lee Mazzilli, several others sitting around. Who's going to win it? Most think it's going to be the Cardinals because of their speed. The way they chase the ball down defensively, they can manufacture runs, score a run without getting a base hit. They've done that many times this year. 
suicide squeeze again the other night with Ozzie, Ozzie Smith dropping it down. How about Cedeno? Three for four again last night. See something? What a find. So he played first base yesterday. They moved Jackie Clark back to right field. Couldn't catch up with that heater. Three and two. More than that last pitch being overpowering, I think that's the one that pitching coach Mal Stottlemyre was talking about. The with the seams fastball that just keeps boring in on the right-hander. And it got Gonzalez tied up inside. A lazy fly ball to center field. Mookie Wilson camped under it. A one, two, three inning for Gooden. A little bit of disappointment from some of the Shea faithful. He's fan. Good strikeout pitcher. Struck out about one per inning in that league. Now, I'm one of those believers that to get a proper mix in chemistry on a team, you've got to have a Wally Backman. Remember what Julio Cruz meant to the White Sox a couple of years ago? Kind of a feisty player. Now you got some low key guys here with George Foster. I think Strawberry basically is good. Hernandez, a little bit, although he's quite a leader on the field, but a backman gives you that little spark. You look at pennant contenders, whether it was the Yankees with Billy Martin, or teams along the way, you like to have a guy like this for the proper mix. Of course, the Mets just hope the bottom doesn't drop out for Backman as it did for Julio Cruz. Had the one good year for the White Sox, and he's been woeful since. Slaps it by Gonzalez. Gonzalez was in yeah. tight to protect against the butt, and Backman said, okay, if you'll challenge me, I'll hit it right at you and he buy did. you. He did it in the first inning, and he doubled in the left field corner. It's one thing thinking about doing something like that, but being able to execute it, the short stuff up in Toronto, Tony Fernandez can already do that. Fake a butt one time, sets you up. Next time, drive it by you. Not as consistently as Backman yet. The Cardinals have something going in the bottom of the sixth at St. Louis. Her and Clark single to open the inning. Second hit of the day for Tommy Her. Then Andy Van Slyke delivered a ground rule double. It's 6-2. Runners at second and third, nobody out. And Terry Pendleton is the hitter there. Strike one on the inside corner to Hernandez. With all the people you can make cases for for the MVP, whether it's Pedro Guerrero, Carter here. I, I kind of like Willie McGee. <laughs> Her is going to get some votes obviously Gooden you've got to consider him as overpowering he's been but McGee defensively and offensively and all else he's had some kind of year going there goes the runner good pitch to run on too an off-speed breaking ball and he swipes it standing up now Arcelac playing behind him the left-hander up they figure with a seven run lead they would not run but that's the old Maury Wills line. You know, there used to be kind of an unwritten law, law of the jungle. You steal when you're way ahead, we're going to knock you down or hit you the next time. Maury Wills said, hey, look, do we tell people to stop hitting home runs when they've got us 10 to nothing? My legs are my biggest asset. I'm going to go. Of good on the mound. He's not going to score home any, so the game is all but wrapped up. So that one hurts the Pirates with Backman taking off and running. Hurts their pride. Broken bat by Lecky. Throws Hernandez out. Backman holds at second. Give you an idea of the sneakiness of Balecki's fastball. Nobody outs runner on second. Hernandez was trying to hit the ball to the right side. At least get a ground ball. Try to get a base at RBI, of course, too. That would have been an added plus. But Balecki got the ball inside on him and broke his bat in two. You know, this guy's outgoing personality, speaking of Carter, has really found the proper outlet in New York. He commented right away on the change of atmosphere. In his entire career in Montreal, he had but one curtain call, fans demanding that he come out of the dugout. That was after he had a three-homer game against the Pirates in 1977. Hit all three against Jim Rooker. His first day in a Met uniform, he homered to win the season opener against the Cardinals. Came out to wave to the fans, and he's had countless curtain calls since. And he's been one of the emotional leaders. That fist pumping up in the air, the high fives. Center field and Orsalak will get back. 
That's the second out. Backman played it halfway. That's when they're really Backman should tag up on. Barslick has a good throw. He tags up, gets the third. Perhaps he'll score a wild pitch. Right now, a little update, New York, Glenn Berman. All right, thanks, Tony. Bottom of the sixth in Houston. It's Bert Pena, pinch hitter, singling. Here comes Eddie Milner up throwing, but Glenn Davis scores it. Houston has regained the lead 5-4 to four after six innings in the Astrodome. All right, quickly back to Shea now to Bob and Tony. Interesting, interesting question about the Astros as Strawberry steps in, and we'll get into it after this first pitch, which is a ball. It was widely assumed when Dick Wagner replaced Al Rosen as the general manager there that Bob Lillis's days were number two. Until last night, however, the Astros had won nine in a row. Is Lillis saving his job? Perhaps. Dr. McMullen has already said that it wasn't the fault of Rosen. Wasn't the fault or isn't the fault of Bob Lillis. Same as Bob Lurie did in San Francisco when they got rid of Tommy Haller, Jim Davenport. Roger Craig taking over the managers. It's not their fault, but sometimes it's time for a change. You got to make a change for the sake of it sometime. You can't, the old story, you can't get rid of 25 players, can you? But Lillis is a solid baseball man. Given the proper talent mix, a little more power, and of course his pitching staff hurt him aside from Scott this year. In St. Louis, the Cardinals knocked Gullickson out. Gary Lucas replaced him. Three and one. And he was greeted by a Terry Pendleton single that scored two. Now the lead is 6 4 Montreal. Pendleton is at first, and still nobody out in the last half of the sixth. Both starters, Tudor and Gullickson, are history. A walk to the straw man. You know, the thing, we've talked about this with the Cardinals before. They're big three starting, and about their speed. When you talk a lot about speed and pitching, you immediately think that that team can't hit. Remember, they're leading National League in team batting average with 200, uh, 266 average and leading the National League in run scored. Able to run like they do, you've got to be able to hit the ball. Even though Hurt tapered off a little bit since the All-Star game and McGee was hurt, didn't steal a beast for almost a year, they're still hitting the ball well. Heap sends a fly to center field and Orsalak should have it. The Mets strand a couple and still lead 8-1 at the end of six at Chase. A lead thanks to a grand slam by Andre Dawson and a home run by Andre Galarraga. They led 6-1 and the Cardinals now starting to flap their wings here in the sixth. And that's ball four and the tying runs are aboard with one out. Bill Campbell is due to come up. All eyes are on the St. Louis dugout here at Bush Stadium and who will it be? Will it be Cedeno? That's the big question. Gary Lucas would like to know. And it will be Cedeno. of the 20th century going out to the mound. Cesar Cedeno, we mentioned earlier, it was breakfast when Whitey Herzog asked Jim Cott about his availability. Cott said he'll find out and asked Pete Rose. Pete Rose asked Bill Burgess, and within 24 hours, Cedeno became a cardinal. There are a lot of reasons why he became a cardinal. Among other, a $600,000 contract. We'll be right back. as they make the pitching change in St. Louis. Bob Costas back with Tony Kubek here at Shea Stadium. Two outs, nobody on in the top of the seventh, and this is the pinch hitter, Lee Mozilli, who is batting for Bilecki. Swings on the first one. It'll be a chance for Strawberry. Kemp opened the inning by pinch hitting and lining hard to Strawberry. Ortiz popped to short, and now Mozilli, the pinch hitter, flies out. It's still 8-1, to one, and here's another edition of seventh inning stretch. Variety ball player, but he is an American beauty. He's been rambling through baseball for 23 years. Can you move larger than Pete Rose, who began his playing career right at home in Cincinnati in 1963 and went on to spark the Big Red Machine to four pennants and two World Series titles. 
Nothing came easy for Pete. He worked at becoming one of the game's greatest hitters. From Cincinnati, Pete went on to play with the Phillies and the Expos before returning home as player-manager. Now, the goal of Ty Cobb's all-time hit record has brought the Rose career to full flower. And Buck Rogers does not have Jeff Reardon available. He's got a full groin muscle. Let's go to St. Louis. Cedeno with first and second and one out. Cedeno hitting for Campbell against Burt Robert. That's right. Robert, a 31-year-old right-hander out of Lewiston, Maine. And Cedeno with five home runs as a Cardinal. Imagine he had three home runs in 220 at bats for the Reds and he's had five home runs it seems like in a couple of days for the Cardinal 26 for 56 with 16 runs batted in since he came over and he finds Pendleton at second Smith at first and a pickle play in progress. Left handed Jack O'Connor in the Montreal pen. It's been Gullickson. Lucas and Robert. Gullican could still win. He's the pitcher of record. The tying runs belong to Lucas. And a big play by Tim Wallach, or Montreal would be really up to its hips in trouble. That's a strike. 0 oh 2. Two tough pitches, breaking balls. That one right on the outside corner. Bird Robert came up with Houston in 79, again in 80 and 82. Played briefly for the White Sox in 84. He was acquired in the deal for infield of Brian Little. Sedeno with that $600,000 contract, and it will come to an end when this season ends. So Cincinnati felt it would be a good time to unload him. The Cardinals felt the extra money was well worth it since they have a chance to win. 0 and 2 to Sedeno. Pendleton back to the bag. Ozzie Smith at first. The only out was a great diving stop by Wallach, an even greater catch at the other end by Andre Galarraga to stay on the bag to take a hit away from Tito Landrum. 0 oh 2. Line drive into left field. Sedeno's done it again. Pendleton will score. It is 6 5. He got a fastball right down the middle with two strikes. It looked like Butera wanted the ball inside. He just laid it right in there, and Cedeno jumped all over it. That run is charged to Lucas. It is now Montreal six and the Cardinals five. Ozzie Smith, the tying run at second, and Vince Coleman coming up with one out. Cedeno last night hit an 0 and 2 pitch for a triple. And hits an 0 2 pitch for a RBI single. And with the speed they got coming up, chances for a double play, there it's possible but not probable. Boy, you're right there. Coleman has hit into one double play this year, and that was as a right handed batter. So Daniel at first, Ozzie Smith at second, one out. Four one. In fact, the speed is forcing the shorten up the infield they're in tight and Hubie Brooks now talking to his second baseman Vance Law speed I'll tell you run you crazy it, it, it's a catalyst it never runs into a slump and it's got you thinking all the time it's it's like Ghostbusters there have been five hits and a walk in this sixth inning for the Cardinals way outside but Jack O'Connor continues to throw in the pen with Willie McGee on deck you have McGee and her no rest for the weary back to back switch hitters following Coleman who switches and as we said he did it hitting right hand two and off in there Jeff Lottie the number one guy along with Warrell in the Cardinal bullpen and Lottie is up it is six to five Montreal the Cardinals were down six to one. Two and one to Vince Coleman. Gullickson, Lucas, and Roberge. The Cardinals with Tudor, Kepshire, and Campbell. The 
best pitches of record at least for the moment. Tudor and Gullickson. He shortened up too. And down he goes anyway. Trying to uppercut. He had made a bad swing on a pitch before and that's the one thing he does do is strike out. And he got the big out there by getting the strike out. Now it's up to McGee. He chases a bad ball here. Previous pitch was a bad ball. Low inside, real bad. I'll tell you what's interesting, that's the first strikeout for a Cardinal today. Okay, our thanks to Vin and Joe. Santana is at the plate here in the bottom of the seventh for the Mets. Howard Johnson led the inning off with a single. He was just picked off first base by the new pitcher, Ray Krawchick. They've also got a new shortstop, Kemp having hit for Khalifa in the last inning. It's the veteran Johnny Lamaster at short. Full count to Santana. Johnson base set single to right. Before this happened, well, Davey Johnson is getting in trouble with Chuck Tanner and the Pirates. He had Howard Johnson on the move and a hit and run. Santana for the seven run lead. Up the middle for a Santana base hit. The Expos have retired Willie McGee on a fly ball and that apparently ends the inning. But things are shaken now in St. Louis. It's just mm. six five Expos after six. Gooden has homered lined hard to third and single. He has four RBIs. Will he bunt to keep him off the base? He's going to let him hit. One out. In an 8 1 game, the way Gooden is swinging the bat and enjoying himself, if Johnson asked him to sacrifice, I don't think he'd be too pleased. Well, you, you know, you want to conserve his energy. Not that he's had to work that hard. He's retired 11 of the last 12. In fact, uh, he looks like he's been toying with the Pirates since the fourth inning pitching an infield hit. He has struck out just one. Allowed one hit, and he's retired 10 out of 12. I mean, it's just like here it is, hit the ball, and the Pirates haven't been able to do that. My point was that with one out, you sacrifice just to keep him from having to run hard down to first base in case he hits a ground ball or run out an extra base. Get him back in the dugout as fast as you can. Curveball outside, two and one. Gooden has pitched 14 complete games this year. And that ties him with Fernando Valenzuela for the league lead. But with an 8 1 lead, Johnson has to think about the possibility of getting him out of there before this is over to conserve his energy. But not before he gets his third base hit. And Santana heads for third. He's got that bat splintered in three different areas one in front of the third baseman, Gonzalez, one halfway between third base and the. He's getting a standing ovation for his three at ball game. Leading a charmed life, even when the bat is broken in two, it's a little flare for a three for four afternoon. There are the toothpicks. remains. You know, I was talking to a fellow from the bat company about why so many bats are breaking. He said that some guys will break three in one game. Ogilvy and four at bats one day broke three bats, he said. He said they are asking for such light wood. And when they put them into the drying kilns, they take so much moisture out that the bats are getting almost so light, 30 ounces, 29 ounces, 34, 35 inches, that they're just like balsa wood. And they're shattering in batter's hands with the thin handles and all the moisture content out. Mookie Wilson takes a ball. So three straight singles in this inning. It could be worse for the Pirates, but Krawczyk picked Johnson off first base after his leadoff hit. Runners at the corners, one out. Liner caught by LeMaster. There's nobody to cover first, so Gooden is able to get back. For a second there, I thought we'd found something out that Dwight Gooden couldn't do, run the bases. LeMaster wisely hung onto the ball as Bream couldn't get behind him. And he even did that well. He gets a start in the line drive before the ball hit the glove of LeMaster. Gooden was on his way back retreating so he wouldn't get doubled off and take him out of an inning. There's something like physical ability and composure, but they're the instinctive qualities that the Willie Mays have or the Lou Brocks. You can't teach those things, and Gooden's got in every area. 
Top of the seventh in St. Louis. New battery for the Cardinals. Jeff Lottie is the pitcher. Darrell Porter was removed in the bottom half of the sixth. The Tom Nieto is the new catcher. And Cesar Cedeno has stayed in the game in left field for Vince Coleman. So Whitey's toughest job, replacing Bruce Suter. Lottie anchoring the bullpen down there. And he's just kind of gotten them through. They've got over 40 saves. They've got about 40 saves now already, don't they? Look at Suter at 45 all of last year. The man's a genius, Whitey Herzog. Another base hit for Backman. He did it again. Almost placed it surgically into that spot by Gonzalez. Wally Backman using that bat like a finely tuned musical instrument. He's playing Gonzalez at third like he's a xylophone. Doesn't know which way to go. Up the keyboard, down the keyboard. He moves to the line. That's a bad analogy, huh? Playing like a xylophone? I think you've worked the metaphor for about all it's worth, you but it was delightful while it lasted. Look, there's an eight-run difference in his <laughs> ballgame with Gooden going out there. Trying to salvage your act. 9-1 <laughs> New York. Backman is three for five, and he has a stolen base. Couple of singles and a double. One and one. A ball and two strikes. So after Cedeno came through with the pinch hit, Herzog left him in the game in St. Louis because Coleman batted immediately thereafter. So Cedeno would be due to hit again sooner. So Coleman is removed in a double switch situation. You know, I wonder if uh, Davey Johnson down on the bench asked Gooden about continuing the ball game, whether he wanted a bunt hit, whatever else, see how he feels. And perhaps Gooden, who is one of those, very proud to get complete games, something that's a lost art on some occasions. He's going to start a run, too. Krawczyk felt like it was part of a pinball machine, and Gooden comes across. It caromed off his foot and all the way into left field. Hernandez with an RBI. It's 10-1 New York. A sinking fastball on the outer edge. Hernandez goes with it. Hits it very crisply. Almost knocks Krawczyk down. Gooden's got to avoid getting hit by the ball as Lamaster had started up the middle of the diamond. But Harrelson says, keep on coming. Ron Reynolds, who replaced Gary Carter back of the plate to give Carter a much-needed rest. His first at-bat. To say that Krawczyk has been ineffective would be kind. Five singles and a vicious line-out by Wilson to shortstop and the other out recorded on a pickoff at first base. He has fooled no one. Called strike at the letters, which you don't often see these days. Strike zone seems to get lower and lower, although some, yourself included, Tony, would say it also gets wider and wider. I think so. I think with an inside protector. In fact, I ran into... There's the scores pertinent to the Eastern Division race. Montreal 6, St. Louis 5. Gooden here looks like he's got his 22nd win wrapped up. He's looking for his 15th complete ball game if he finishes. Ran into Bill Holler, brother of Tom Holler, who was just fired by San Francisco, and he was talking about that, about some of the umpiring with the inside protecting the American League, how he feels that the strike zone is shrinking and getting wider. High fives, low elbows, all kinds of celebrations. 9,931. A few folks had freebies. Total in the house, 51,400. New first baseman is Tom Pachorek. Acquired him from the White Sox to help down the stretch, and he has done just that. You know, his older brother, John Pachorek, played with the Houston Colt 45s in the early part of their history before they became the Astros. And for about a week, he was a teammate of Rusty Stobbs in 1963, Stobbs' rookie season. And now Rusty, of course, Tom Pachorek's teammate here with the Mets. John Pachorek went three for three in his only major league game. That's the highest number of at-bats for any player in big league history who never made an out. But he had to retire because of congenital back problems and never again played another major league game. Orsalak at the top of the order to face Gooden. It's 10-1 Mets in the eighth. 
off Gooden's glove and Santana won't have time. So just the fourth base hit off Gooden. They've all been singles. Since that last base hit an infield hit also by Gonzalez back in the fourth it has just been like a cat toying with a mouse. Now they've had one base hit since then. R.J. Reynolds is single to center field, but he's just saying, here it is, throw it, hit it. Not trying for strikeout, trying to conserve himself. A power pitcher, not a thrower. He's learned to pitch. Knew that when Davey Johnson saw the first time and requested that he pitch for him in triple-A ball in the playoffs. The Little World Series. But, uh, Frank Cash and I don't believe the president of this ball club, general manager, didn't want to move him up that quickly in the minor leagues. And Davey John said he can't learn anything more down in the minor leagues. Give me two of 1 1 Milwaukee, Toronto. RJ Reynolds has solved Gooden fairly well. He's two for three. Curveball fouled down the left side. It's 0 and 2. Good one at the Astrodome. And the Reds trying to put some pressure on the Dodgers. Four and a half back. For the loss count. That's all Pete Rose has his team behind the Los Angeles Dodgers. Gooden has thrown unofficially 97 pitches. Some high heat, and RJ Reynolds takes a seat. It's just the fourth strikeout for Dr. K. After his low pitch game the last time out, it looked like a big strikeout game, but he hasn't needed. Here, what, what it is a tale of two seasons. Well, by Steve Horn and Jeff Simon. What Gooden has done his first two seasons, as opposed to Nolan Ryan, Walter Johnson, the big train, Steve Carlton. And they put a lot more research. They went back to Christy Matthews and a lot of other great names, the Warren Spons, Robin Roberts. And Gooden, in just two years, ages 19 and 20, has done better than all those. He belongs in another league already. They got a higher classification for this guy. He does appear to operate out of a galaxy of his own, doesn't he? Even with the bat today. Three base hits, one of them a homer. And if the Mets should go all the way to the World Series, and there's a long pennant race ahead yet, it seems like it's only 15 games, but it'll seem a lot longer these teams involved as a scoreboard watch. No DH in the World Series this year. And you get hitters like Gooden, Fernandez. Aguilera hits the ball well if they get in. It's a little bit of an edge they'll have against the American League. Tudor swings the bat well with the Cardinals. Bells whale across the Dodgers should they get in. This will be Gooden's 22nd victory against just four defeats. He has three more starts remaining. Wednesday at Wrigley Field. Then Tuesday, October 1st in St. Louis, he'll pitch the first of the three games against the Cardinals. Out of play two and two. And then if need be, Davey Johnson would have him ready for the regular season finale here at Shea Stadium Sunday October 6th against Montreal. Johnson will have Gooden and Darling for the first two games against the Cardinals. He's already maneuvered his rotation so that it works out that way. In the third game it'll be Ed Lynch if his back is OK. The 2 2 pitch. Breaking ball and Ray got a piece of it. You know when you take Dwight Gooden back to the end of last season it becomes more amazing. Dwight's last nine starts last year is eight and one. ERA of just over one point zero zero. So you add those last nine starts to his totals of this year. He's twenty nine and five in his last forty one starts with a one point four nine ERA. How can you get any better. Ray gets a piece of the curveball, but Mookie Wilson will be right there for the catch. Ch 
Jack Clark, we understand now, has just hit a two-run home run for St. Louis. Clark, of course, out with that rib cage damage. He's swinging the bat, finally feels well enough to play. So they start hit some home runs now, he and Cedeno. After trailing five to nothing and six to one, the Cardinals now lead seven to six. They haven't put it up on the scoreboard yet here at Shea Stadium. Fans will have some pangs of anxiety when they see it. Here's Bream. Curveball for a called strike. The inning began when Tommy Herr was hit by a pitch. And it hurt the Expos more than it hurt Tommy. Because Clark followed with the two run homer, 7 6, St. Lou. He might be the edge in this division. Jack Clark? Mm -hmm. Well, Goodness cited him as the most dangerous pitcher rather most dangerous hitter he has to pitch to. He says Clark is the guy he fears the most. He retires Bream on the catch. It's 10-1 after seven. Clark, and there it goes. A two-run homer. The Cards had trailed Montreal 5-0. They now lead a, a 7-6, and that lets John Tudor off the hook. Let's go back to Shea now, to Bob and Tony. All in all, it won't make any difference what the Mets do unless the Cardinals lose somewhere along the line. The Expos have beaten them nine times in 13 tries this year and led six to one, but the Cardinals have stormed back for the 7-6 lead, the latest blow, the two-run homer by Jack Clark. So Cedeno picked the Cardinals up in Clark's absence, and as soon as Jack returns, he contributes. Well, it was at least a month ago and probably a little bit longer ago that Keith Hernandez said the season would boil down to those three games in St. Louis, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night, first three days in October, as to whom is going to be the pennant winner in the East. And Keith feels if it does get to that, he thinks they've got the edge in pitching. One-two pitch to Strawberry. Two and two. As we noted, you don't have to tell Gooden about Jack Clark. There was an article in the New York Post yesterday about what hitters, and there are very few of them, give Dwight Gooden trouble. And Gooden cited Clark as the number one guy. He says, I can't fool him, and I can't throw the fastball by him. Strawberry goes down swinging. In 13 career at-bats against Gooden, Jack Clark has hit two homers and has four RBIs. Houston now jumps in front of Cincinnati. And the Dodgers thank them for that. Danny Heap is one for four. Bream picks it off his shoe tops for the second out as we pause briefly for station identification on the NBC television network. You are tuned to WLBZ Channel 2 Bangor and W57AQ Callas. Bob Costas and Tony Kubek back at Shea. Here's the last play, Tony. Heap rifles a curveball. Heap's been a big part of that bench. We mentioned Rusty Staub, the great pinch hitter, but Heap has hit seven home runs, driven in 39 for Davey Johnson. He's also walked 24 times, so that's pretty good contribution off the bench. Something that was so good for Sparky Anderson's Tigers last year. Rupert Jones left. Bergman got hurt. Some of the others didn't produce. Some of the kids didn't come through. The bench went down the hill in some other part of the game. And the Tigers. Mal Stottlemyre and Davey Johnson have had a pitcher up. Tom Gorman was thrown before. Don't know if he's going to bring him in, but they may have that bullpen cart ready. May not want to let Gooden pitch the last inning, save him a little bit. So it'd be too relatively. Well, few pitch ball games that he's thrown 105 pitches in this out if he's done just through 110 the last time out he goes 150 times sometimes some pitches but it's because he'll strike out 10 12 13 after the Clark home run Van Slyke popped to second and Pendleton and Nieto were each retired on fly balls so that's it for St. Louis in the seventh but a big seventh they score twice and claim the lead 7 6 over Montreal. 
That was Mal Stottlemyre on the phone down to the bullpen to see if Gorman was ready. Perhaps starting the next inning. In fact, Stottlemyre was telling me yesterday that his son Todd signed by the Toronto Blue Jays out of college. Now down at the Instruction League in Dunedin, he said, I never thought any pitching coach could run you that hard. Mel Queens said he's really running him. Mel's other son, of course, Mel Jr., property of the Houston Astros. He's had some shoulder problems, had some had his right shoulder scoped a while back. Ray Krawchick. This is high to Howard Johnson. That was good. I like that. Krawchick. <laughs> Chuck Tanner with a lot of Polish blood. We've seen Balecki. Krauchik. Good name for a middle linebacker, right? Eh? <laughs> Here's one drilled by Hojo, and it's over the head of Mike Brown in right field. At least a double. And maybe more, and it will be three. Howard Johnson is now three for five. A single, a double, and now a triple. Brown plays a relatively deep right field. In fact, we've seen Tanner move him in already twice in this ball game. But then the ball took off. It looked like he thought he was going to have it. The ball was hit so hard by Howard Johnson it took off, and he tracks it down rather slowly, and he gets a triple. Just for kicks, Rusty Staub is in the on-deck circle. That Wooden is due to be the next hitter, so either way, he's not going to finish it, doesn't look like. When it comes to the plate, Santana doesn't make the last out. Apparently, Gorman's coming in. And it'll give Johnson, if he has the opportunity, a chance to keep Staub's bat sharp. Gorman will finish it up for Gooden. Gooden apparently won't get a chance to try for a four hit day. This one is off the fist and could be trouble. Judy. It's in there. Couldn't have walked out there and placed it any better. It's 11 1 New York. Ah, these people want to see like around around, yeah? This might be the first time Rusty Staub has ever heard any boos at Shea Stadium while wearing a Met uniform. A lot of these people would prefer to see Gooden hit again. Last 11 pinch hits. He's five for ten with three RBIs and a walk thrown in. He needs just one more pinch hit to become the tenth player to reach the 100 mark. He's one more. He needs a double to have 500 doubles career. His swing has not changed. Choked up on the bat when he was at Houston. Montreal stands even with the plate. Short and quick. Very simple swing. Tremendous concentration. 2-0. Oh. According to Vin Scully, who's broadcasting the game out in St. Louis, Jack Clark re-aggravated that uh -oh. rib injury as he was at the plate in the at-bat that yielded the go-ahead homer. And Mike Jorgensen has replaced Clark at first base as they go to the eighth with the cards leading the Expos 7-6. That's why they took so much time getting him back. Gene Gieselman, one of the fine trainers in baseball for the Cardinals, kept him back, held him down. Moderate batting practice, because that's one that once you re-injure it, you could be gone for the year. Hope it's not that seriously. And of course, their patience has been made easy by the performance of Cedeno. Oh, yeah. No need to rush the way Cesar has been tearing it up. But to be able to have two extra base bats in that lineup. Take it deep. Stop with another base hit. Everybody gets into the act. Rusty Staub is now the 10th player in Major League history with 100 pinch hits. That's the century mark for him. An appreciative standing ovation for Rusty. There goes the rest restaurant business, Rusty. They're all flocking over tonight. He said since the Mets have got really involved in this pennant race, he said he can't keep up with the trade. A breaking ball. 
Look at how effortlessly his swing is. Doesn't do anything to jerk the head, hardly any head movement. Basically with his hands. Remember uh, Gene Mock talking about Rusty Staub, he's a 19-year-old kid. He said, of all the hitters he's ever seen, he said, I played with Ted Williams. Never have I seen a hitter, and he was 19 then, who had more intensity at the plate. And he's retained that into age 40. Manny Mota heads that pinch hit parade at 150. Smokey Burgess at 145. Jose Morales, Jerry Lynch, Terry Crowley, Gates Brown, some of the other names on the list. Steve Braun of the Cardinals has a few base hits ahead of Rusty Staub as a pinch hitter. Right here in this ballpark, I never get, forget Staub. Remember the last part of the season, he had a badly damaged hand, was a wrist or a broken bone. Came out of a cast, a league championship series, World Series, he was hitting the ball all over the place. That'll bring a trip from Grant Jackson, the pitching coach. We've got a right-hander up in the bullpen, another one of the young people that Tanner's getting a chance to look at, trying to evaluate for next year. Jim Wynn is up down in the bullpen in case he wants to use him. Here's what happened in the top of the eighth at Bush Stadium. Jeff Lottie, who is as close to a bullpen ace as Whitey Herzog has right now, still pitching for the Cardinals. Andy Galarraga was retired on a great play at second by Tommy Hur, who threw him out. And then Mitch Webster was retired for the second out. Terry Francona batted for the catcher, Sal Butera, and flied out. And so it's 7-6 with the Cardinals coming up in the bottom of the eighth and looking to maintain the two-game lead over the Mets in the National League East. And after today, each club will have just 14 games remaining. And if you are a lover of middle infield play and you're a National League fan, Sandberg and Tommy Herr are having two great years. It's Sandberg about 310 now. Probably going to get 50 stolen bases, 20-plus home runs. Mm. Bases loaded for Backman. 2-0. and oh. Think Staub is enjoying the opportunity to run the bases. Usually they'll pinch run for him after he gets a hit. If you were Davey Johnston with a 10 run lead, would you pinch it, pinch run for him? No. Oh boy. Still a little <laughs> question to <laughs> idle away some of the time. I'd love to see him scamper home if Backman delivers a hit. Scamper. Might be an overstatement. Well, one more pitch and they'll all trot home. Or at least one will. They'll all trot up 90 feet. Backman, like Wilson before him, his sixth plate appearance. Strike one. Now, I think of scampering like a Vince Coleman or a McGee or Wills or Aparicio and one of Santa's reindeers, but I don't correlate that with Rusty Stop scampering. There is humor in sarcasm. He's and there scamper. is another base hit. All right. He's going to scamper to third and say that'll do it. <laughs> now the throw gets by, but Rusty just tantalizes a bit by dancing down the line. Wally Backman has been something today, hasn't he? And out comes Chuck Tanner for a pitching change. Jim Wynn should be ready. Four base hits for Backman. Two runs across in this inning. 12-1 Mets. Chiefs crown, gate dancer, track baron among the big names pointing to this year's Breeder' Cup. $10 million in prize money. November 2nd, beginning at 12.30 Eastern Time on NBC. Four hours of coverage. Tom Pachorek's first at bat. He replaced Keith Hernandez an inning ago at first base. Jim, Jim wins 25th ball game. Excuse me, Bob. He's had seven game starts. Three five. Three wins, five losses. Doesn't have a save. Today, the Pirates pitching over the last 21 games. It has been better than good. 2.58. In fact, over that stretch, they lowered the team ERA by about a quarter of a run, which is not easy to do when you've got this many innings pitched on the staff at this time of the year. But boy, it's getting battered up today, isn't it? Pachorek with a chance to join in the fun. 12-1, bases loaded. 
Emma Master with a flip to second. And the Pirate agony will be ended shortly. Two more runs. Gorman will finish it for Gooden. It's 12-1. Dwight will be 22-4. The only run he allowed was unearned. So his scoreless string ends at 31 innings, but he hasn't allowed an earned run in his last 39 innings of work. His ERA goes down today from 1.62 to 1.57. With the three hits, his batting average goes up from 205 to 253. Strike one to Mike Brown. Naturally, this week's NBC Light Beer from Miller player of the game is Dwight Gooden, and Light Beer from Miller is happy to present a check for $1,000 in the name of Dr. K to help fight multiple sclerosis. Might be a base hit for Brown. It falls in front of Heath. Top of the ninth in St. Louis. And with one away, Tim Raines singled and then stole second. Scott Thompson batted for the pitcher and grounded a second to open the inning. That was the first out. Then Raines got his third base hit, a single, and proceeded to steal second, his second stolen base of the day. Vance Law is the hitter. Raines in scoring position, one out. Cardinals in front, 7-6, top of the ninth. Denny Gonzalez here. Score this game could be even worse. The Mets have left about a dozen on base also. Could be two. Not that way. Oh, maybe yet. Yeah. Yep. Gonzalez doesn't run that well. And even though Johnson didn't handle it cleanly, they turn it 5-4-3. Gonzalez didn't get a very good jump out of the box. It looks like the wheels were skidding. He stole 40 bases. Last season at Hawaii, he just couldn't get him going. Plus, Howard Johnson was playing right in with the bag, so the ball got to him very quickly. For those keeping track, and I know there are many, Gooden struck out four and walked one in eight innings. LeMaster hasn't seen much action the past two and a half, three months. Had arthroscopic surgery on a knee, and then when he was ready, Sammy Khalifa had settled in. They want to go with the youngsters. That's something that Joe Brown and Chuck Tanner, Harding Peterson before that, a position they've tried to fill, the middle of the diamond. Had Dale Bear there a couple of years ago. They've had several there this year. Khalifa looks like he's going to be their man. They'd like to see him hit a little more. This Pirate Club has difficulty scoring runs. Santana has it. So on the soft liner by LeMaster, the ball game is over. The Mets win it 12 to 1. Meanwhile, in St. Louis, Vance Law grounded out. Reigns holding it second. The Expos are down to their last out, but it's Andre Dawson, who earlier in the ball game had a grand slam. Cardinals lead 7 to 6. Reigns at second, Dawson at the plate, two out, top of the ninth. The Mets with their fingers crossed and with a victory in hand at Shea. We'll be back in a minute. 12 1. Ours has been in direct contrast. The Expos led 6 to 1 thanks to a grand slam by Andre Dawson and a home run by Andre Galarraga. However, the Cardinals fought back and eventually Jack Clark hit a two run home run to give him a 7 6 lead. Now you have two out. Three and two to Andre Dawson. Tim Raines a tying run at third in the ninth inning. Seven six St. Louis. So you joined us just in time. Ball four and the big RBI guy from Montreal Hubie Brooks will be coming up. And coming out is Whitey Herzog. He has Todd Worrell the right hander. And he really loved Worrell. He was saying he's my new Lee Smith in the league, a big right-hander. Worrell throws hard fastballs and slider. So Todd Worrell, last night, every pitch he made in relief was in the 90s, except for a slider that he threw at 85 miles an hour. So Lottie comes out with runners at first and third, two out, and Worrell will go head to head with Hubie Brooks. Don't go wandering.
children off. We got a dandy. The Cardinals seven, the Expos six, but Montreal far from dead. And they're awaiting the resolution of the game at Bush Stadium. The Expos first let a pair of five run leads slip away. They were up five nothing and six one now trail seven to six. And all Davy Johnson and company can do now is hope 